Tix, how's it going? Great, Matt. Wonderful to be with you. Yeah, thank you so much for making your way down. How long did it take you to grow that beard? Well, just the trip this morning? (laughs) Pretty much. You know, it gets about this long in in about a year. Do you get a lot of comments on it? Um, It's pretty much the first comment that everybody makes. Yeah. How long did it take you? That's uh, usually a question. Yeah. When did you start growing that beard? I, uh, yeah. when, I, when I had to use some cheap tricks to win over a high school crowd and get some laughs out of a youth ministry gig, I put a picture of a baby with a beard. <laughs> like, this is me when I was a kid. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I came so, out of the womb with this beard. I feel like monks ought to have beards. It just seems appropriate. Well, our monastery is the first monastery in the U.S. We were founded by Boniface Wimmer. And when he was blessed by Blessed Pius IX, Boniface Wimmer had a great beard, and Bi- Pius IX loved his beard mm. and said, long live Boniface Wimmer and his magnificent beard. Oh, that's nice. So all of our monks at that time were asked to grow beards. Oh, really? Now, how many monks are in your monastery, and where is your monastery? We're in Latrobe, Pennsylvania, just a little west of, a little east of Pittsburgh, and uh, we have about 150 monks. It's the biggest Benedictine monastery in the world. That's amazing. <clears throat> That's bigger than some high schools. I mean, a small <laughs> high school, but still. So yeah. do you know everyone? We have a, a priory in Brazil, and so some of those monks came into the monastery in Brazil. They're officially part of our monastery, so there's mm-hmm. maybe 15, 18 there, a few of whom I don't know. Yeah. The rest of them I know. And, and I imagine you have close, kind of more intimate relationships with some of the monks than... Sure, yeah. And by, by class, the guys that we enter with and around yeah. are in seminary with, uh, and, and then just some spiritual friendships. Uh, so I've written a couple of books with Father Tom Acklin, mm. uh, who's been my spiritual father for 17, 18 years. And uh, so, yeah. And tell us a bit about being a Benedictine monk. You know, what's distinctive about that as opposed to a different order? And Well... The Benedictines are really the first religious order, and in some ways it's like vanilla. It's the, mm. it's the church's introduction to religious orders. I think in the Orthodox Church, it's like the only relig- religious order even still. So it's kind of the fundamental religious order, you might say. Yeah. And we follow the, the rule of St. Benedict. He lived 1,500 years ago and wrote a rule that has been lived continuously. So you can look at St. Augustine wrote a rule, but there haven't been Augustinians around since St. Augustine. The Carmelites like to claim being the first. Please. But yeah, right, exactly. <laughs> there haven't been Carmelites since uh, Mount Carmel yeah. uh, and Elijah. But St. Benedict wrote a rule in 500 that has been followed by monasteries continuously in well, the last so 1,500 why is years. Yeah, well, why, why is it I, so successful? It's, uh, I, I think there's a simplicity to it and there's a flexibility to it. It, it sort of takes hold of some spiritual principles, but then he allows room for the abbot to make adjustments according to time and place. There's a certain moderation to it. Uh, there's, a, there's a previous rule called the rule of the master. It's not entirely clear who the author is, although it's thought that it's St. Benedict. It's really thick. It's hundreds of pages, mm. and it details everything. You know, if the monks wake up an hour late because the bell ringer fell asleep, then this is the uh, thing that you do to correct vigils. And I mean, really down to the every detail. And it's very hard. And uh, St. Benedict uh, apparently was a bit harsher himself. He had fled from Rome, the decadence of Rome, and then went to Subiaco, began to live as a hermit. Some monks asked him to be abbot over them, and he told them, I'm going to be too harsh. And they insisted, and then he, he was right, and they tried to kill him. And what? Uh, they, we think we've got problems in the church today, <laughs> and we do, but I haven't heard of something like that. <laughs> so, so he went back into the cave and let them be. But there's one line that says, well, it's the kind of St. Benedict who wrote the rule of the master who emerged from the hermitage. He was probably really strong and had high expectations, high standards. But then what eventually developed into the rule of Benedict seems to have a real appreciation for the limits of our humanity. Mm. So this big book you were talking about, that was written prior to Benedict's rule? Yeah, so there's, it's, a, it's a little bit like uh, when we do the synoptic comparisons mm-hmm. and you see, wow, you know, <laughs> Matthew's or whatever, Mark's mm-hmm. gospel has exactly the same text. In, in Benedict's rule, you have exactly the same text as the rule of the master, but there's a lot of stuff missing, and then there are interesting additions. And so you can make this kind of comparison. So what are some interesting things about the Benedictine rule that people might not know of? 
Well, a, an example of this moderation, which is uh, which is kind of fun. Saint Benedict, who also he, he comes forward as a as a sort of idealist on a few occasions in in the rule, and one of them is uh, we hear that monks should not drink wine, but since the monks of our day cannot be convinced of this. <laughs> <laughs> Let us at least agree to drink moderately. This is what it says, just like that. Just like that. That is very humorous. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, and St. Benedict allows for a siesta after after the midday meal. Mm -hmm. He also allows for monks who may not want to have a siesta. So he, there's, a, there's a certain flexibility there. But he says then at least they need to be quiet mm. and respect the other monks who do want to have a siesta. So there's a, so a kind of human quality to it. It's a... Uh, He's Italian. It's yeah. nice. Well, was it the 1500s with Teresa and John of the Cross, I believe, trying to reform the Carmelites? Has there been something like that in the Benedictine order? Is there a desire to kind of go back to live a more rigorous life? Well, the, uh, the, the Benedictine, the expression of the Benedictine life uh, became very diverse very quickly. Within 30 years of the death of St. Benedict, a Benedictine was made Pope, Gregory the Great. Mm. And then Gregory the Great sent Benedictine missionaries to England. And so the Benedictine order, which normally we would think is a you know, cloistered monastic, were missionaries within 50 years of the death of St. Benedict. Interesting. A hundred years after that, St. Boniface went to Germany from England. And so this missionary Benedictine thread goes hand in hand with a more uh, cloistered studying, praying. So there's, there's always been some diversity there. But then uh, Benedictine monasticism became very integral to Catholic Europe, uh, tied in with Charlemagne, the Holy Roman Empire, Benedictine monasteries, really established culture. Abbots became kind of a, a local bishop and, and still celebrate mass like a bishop as a, as a result of that. And that grew up into some very big monastic orders, the Order of Cluny, for example, or the, the Monastery of Cluny and a number of the daughter houses. They had basically perpetual divine office. They had shifts of monks praying the liturgy of the hours and, and for the intentions of the nobility. And, but that grew to such a place. And this was under Saint Abbot. So it wasn't like there were problems, but there was also a desire to get back to a simplicity of the rule. And that's when uh, three monks went and founded the monastery at Citeaux, which developed into the Cistercian order. They, mm. they hit some hard times, and about uh, five or six years after they were founded, St. Bernard showed up with his entire family. Mm. So literally his entire family. Uh, his, his brother left his wife, and uh, his father came, and uh, the whole family, along with 30 others or 28 others who joined them. So anyway, the Cistercians were a reform in the, uh, the 11th century. And then the, the Trappists were a f reform of the Cistercians in the 17th century or so in La Trappe in France. And there have been a few other, the, the Camaldolese who we have here down the road are a kind of uh, certain specialization. There's, a, there's an option in the rule for hermits. St. Benedict identifies four kinds of monks, the monks who live in community, and then some of them become strong enough to live the solitary life as hermits, and then the other two are reprehensible. Yeah, which are what? Cerebites who follow their own will and gyrovagues who go everywhere. And what would you be? <laughs> <laughs> that last one you sort of sound like. I mean, stop. <laughs> stop now. I could be accused of being a gyrovague, but yeah. I... <laughs> So the, uh, one of the things that we do as Benedictines is make a vow of stability. So mm. I always come back to home base, which is my monastery. But it sounds like what you're saying is that even from the earliest days of the Benedictines, you had some of them leaving the monastery to evangelize and come back. So this isn't, so if you were to kind of return to how it was originally, you wouldn't necessarily have to stop traveling and do podcasts with me. And like that. <laughs> is that right or no? Well, I think uh, Augustine of Canterbury never came back. He went to go found monasteries. And, uh, but certainly okay. evangelization, missionary work. But, but, but in that sense, he, he that went to found a monastery and presumably remained there, took a vow of stability there. He made a new, yeah, new monastery, new stability. St. Boniface, though, really was a lifelong missionary. He, he was eventually ordained a bishop and then sent into Germany to evangelize that way. Mm. Uh, he retired at age 75. He retired to the, one of the monasteries he founded. He lasted for about a year and a half, and then he went back out into the mission field where he was martyred. So I'm not sure what that says <laughs> about that missionary spirit that can't quite stop. But Because my understanding was part of the point of the mendicant orders was to 
be like monks, but in the world to live in the more suburban areas and evangelize. So presumably they were taking on a role in that sense that the Cistercians and Benedictines weren't. But is that still the case today? Or do you have monks like yourself who preach missions? And Oh, sure. Yeah, there are... Uh well, and, and our monastery is, is especially outward-facing. Uh, our, our founder, Boniface Wimmer, was actually a diocesan priest when there were no monasteries in Europe. Uh, from 1800 to 1830, all religious life uh, was suppressed in Germany. The monasteries were closed. When they opened them back up in 1832, he eventually joined, but always had this very missionary spirit. Mm-hmm. And so uh, he... Uh, founded St. Vincent in Latrobe, my monastery, with a, with a view of taking care of the needs of Catholics in the area. So mm-hmm. he always had this very missionary outlook, and, and our monks have been involved in lots of things. We run a college and a seminary. We also have foreign missions in Brazil and Taiwan at the moment. Uh, we actually founded the first Catholic university in China back in the 20s wow. in Beijing. And uh, so we've always had a very apostolic spirit and, uh, and other monasteries as well. A number of our daughter houses uh, do as well. Monte Cassino, was, the f- was that the first monastery that Benedict founded? So Benedict was a hermit in Subiaco, okay. uh, which is not too far from Assisi, if I'm not mistaken about that. Uh, and he founded his first monasteries there, about mm. a dozen monasteries. So after the, mo- the monks that tried to poison him, mm-hmm. uh, he went back into the, into the cave, but then some others found him a little later, and maybe he was more ready and they were more ready. And that's where he lived 30 years, was with those dozen monasteries. And then the local parish priest tried to kill him. And so he took that as a sign that it was time to move on, and that's when he <laughs> went to Monte Cassino, which is where his, uh, okay. his relics are. Oh, I see. Yeah, which is where Aquinas would have been an oblate and That's as right. a young yeah, child, yeah, yeah, perhaps yeah. even wearing the Benedictine habit. Yeah, yeah. But not having made official vows since he was too young and then, of course, joined the uh, Dominicans. I love your habit. It's so cool. <laughs> I, I love just the simplicity of it. Uh, here's a question for you, which I'm not sure if you know the answer to or not, but we'll see. Why is it that in the Orthodox Church you don't have, it seems at least, the same sort of uh, reforms of monasticism and uh, the, the different types of monasticism? Do you know? Well, the so Aquinas uh, and the, the real the real introduction of other religious orders happens in 1200. Right. So, which is after the split. Uh, right. It's, 1054, right? Thereabouts, yeah. yeah. So, um, so St. Francis, St. Dominic, the whole development of the mendicant orders happened a little bit later. Why, why it happened in the West and not in the East, uh, okay. I'm, I'm not entirely but sure. But if you were to look at the Cistercians, the Trappists, the Benedictines, they all look basically the same. They're all monastic, yeah. So it's yeah. just a way of interpreting. You, you made the, the comparison with the Carmelites. It would be mm-hmm. more like that. I mean, the, the Reformed Carmelites look basically like the non-Reformed Carmelites, just living the, the, mm-hmm. the rule in a, a stricter way and, and uh, different sort of ext- interpretation of the rule. But the Mendicant Orders are, are a whole new phenomenon. Yes. And then... Uh, and then you'd have several centuries later uh, with the development of active religious women mm. with uh, St. Saint, uh, Saint Louise de Marillac and St. Vincent de Paul founded the first order of, of active women nuns. Mm. Um, how did you first hear about the Benedictines? Because I know you're a convert, and I'm very looking forward to hearing that story. <laughs> uh, well, from the, the priest who baptized me. So uh, yeah. the, uh, our Benedictines run the campus ministry at Penn State. And so you were how old when you were baptized? It's 21. How did you become a Catholic? I, uh, <laughs> we have time. <laughs> <laughs> well, there are uh, short, medium, and long versions of the story. So you can, uh, medium. You can, you can press, <coughs> uh, press the point and open up the space uh, yes. at any point. Okay. But uh, I was raised... Uh, I, I've learned to be careful about this. There's a way I can tell my story that it th- seems to throw my parents under the bus, mm. which, uh, which I don't want to do, and they don't deserve to have happened to them because my parents weren't really raised anything. Uh, but they grew up in the 40s and 50s when the country was still Christian. And being good people, breathing Christian air, they sort of absorbed a lot of Christianity. But uh, I just have one sibling, and my brother and I, growing up in the 70s and 80s, were no longer living in a mm. quite-so-Christian-saturated air and uh, so as I moved through high school, 
Uh, I was very into science. I was, uh, I don't know, cutting edge enough, uh, self-sufficient. My parents really, to their credit, loved me well enough to give me a lot of confidence, which also developed into a lot of pride and arrogance, uh, which is a constant battle for me. But um, coming into college at Penn State, I didn't think that anybody was seriously Christian. I just had had no serious Christian witnesses in my life prior to that. And Were you baptized? I was never baptized. So, right. Yeah. So good, good Christian people in the sense that they, as you say, are, are kind of imbibed the morally. But they, uh, they it's not clear themselves. that my mother was ever baptized. Uh, the uh, to, to skip ahead towards the end of the story, I conditionally baptized her. Oh, uh, beautiful. A, a year or two before she died. Yeah. So. Um, yeah, my parents weren't really raised going to church. My dad went to church a little bit. My mother never went to church growing up. And so they didn't really have anything to offer to me and my brother. And it was, I guess, not a, a burning enough question. We, we made a little foray in that direction when I was uh, in middle school, I guess. And, but I was already, even then, had sort of written off the idea. So, so coming into college, I considered myself atheist and didn't think that I was particularly avant-garde by doing so. I just thought, like any normal scientist, well-adjusted person, didn't believe in God. And uh, I met a number of Catholics immediately after I got to Penn State who were in the scholars program in science and engineering and going to mass and completely incapable of explaining to me why they were going to mass. And by the end of college, they were not going to mass. Mm -hmm. uh, so that didn't work. <laughs> Because of you or because of the culture in the university? Um, just, well, I think the shallowness of their own faith. So um, when you were questioning them, was it in a sort of antagonistic way or were you genuinely interested? I, I, I was genuinely interested and it was probably antagonistic. Uh, that's uh, lest I would be vulnerable, you know. Mm, so, yes. Uh, but I was, I was genuinely interested. I remember having a conversation in... Uh, you know, as a freshman in college, we spent these long nights talking about all of these amazing things because we were whatever, <laughs> uh, so cool. And, what amazing uh, things? What do you mean? Oh, I, you know, like the, the state of the world I and see. how to you yes. know, solve uh, world hunger or something. I mean, just anyway. Mm -hmm. um, but I asked them at one point, I said, so you guys go to mass, or I probably said to church. And they said, yeah. And I said, and like, you believe in God? And they said, uh, yeah. And like, what does that mean? You talk to him? And they started to get a little uncomfortable. Yeah. And then I said, and then what? And then does he talk back? So how about them Stillers? Yeah, that was a good game this last weekend. <laughs> it's, uh, so that was about the extent of my conversation. Mm. Kind of ran into a limit. And, uh, but uh, in, the, in the midst of that, after my freshman year at Penn State, I was doing some research over the summer and sitting out under a tree, enjoying a nice technical paper in computer science. And uh, a total stranger walked up to me and eventually asked me if I would study the Bible with him one-on-one. -on -one. God bless our Protestant brothers and sisters. <laughs> I presume that this was a Protestant Christian. Yes, indeed. Yeah. And uh, So he came up to you and just asked you flat total out. Total stranger. Glory yeah. to God. Yeah. If you're a Protestant watching right now, we love you. <laughs> we want you to be Catholic, but we don't want you to cease to be awesome. Please come in and bring that zeal with you. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. And, and uh, to his credit, I mean, a really humble, authentic man. And so I didn't really have an excuse. Why not? I had kind of opened up some things. My cousin was studying philosophy at Penn State. We'd have these philosophical discussions. I, I think I had read Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance by this time. I was becoming, you know, sort of uh, looking at the transcendent, thinking, thinking big things. And I thought, well, whatever, you know, I can give Christianity a try. This guy wants to sell me something. And so I'll at least uh, listen to what he has to say. And then he tells me that we'll start with the book of Genesis. I thought, oh, well, anyway. So I'll just straighten him out about science, and then I'll move on with my life. And uh, in the meantime, he just, very, again, very humbly and authentically, just didn't engage me in debate. He didn't try to convince me of things. He didn't he just really shared his faith. And as we read Genesis chapter 1, it became clear to me that this was not a cookbook on universe creation, but rather a story of relationships, God's relationship with creation, God's relationship with man, man's relationship with creation. And at the end of uh, our, our Bible study, he said, you know, God made man with a purpose. And 
Do you ever think what that might be for you? Back off, dude. Yeah, he's well, getting, I, he's got, he's getting in there, right? That's well, an intimate. I, yeah, yeah, that's right. And I and he was really good at you know he didn't press me to answer that question, but mm. just left it that way. And and so I I felt free to. It was just a totally different worldview. You know, my idea was I I was given this life. I need to make the most of it that I can. Uh, I was on my path to a good paying job. I uh, was dating a girl at that time. You know, I have a wife, two and a half children, a dog, a house, and uh, you know live the the American dream. And he just totally shifted that, like, I was made with a purpose, and, and did I think of what that might be? So, so it was a great experience. He was very vulnerable, honest, authentic, and it opened that up in me. So I came back the next week and the next week. Was it just the, the two of week, you, or was there the a two group? of us, okay. yeah. Wow. Yeah, they're very committed. It's a group called the University Bible Fellowship, and that's their mission, to do Bible studies with college students one-on-one. -on -one. Bless them. And, uh, and really to send them back into their own churches. So they're not principally, you know, they're, they're non-denominational as much as one can be non-denominational. So uh, they're not trying to quote unquote sheep steal as it were. That's right, yeah. So, I mean, it, in reality, they do have a ministry, they do have house churches, they mm -hmm. do have some of those elements. Um, but it's it's part of, the, part of my story that they didn't really have a church and so, after about a year of this Bible study, we moved, we went through Genesis chapter by chapter through the story of Abraham, and I had no way to connect any of this to my life. In fact, I remember David, the man I was studying the Bible with, asking me, like, if, if God said to you, like he said to Abraham, to take everything and leave and go to a place he would show you, would you do that? And I thought, if God showed up to me and talked to me? Yeah, I think I'd do that. So you can see how that worked out. <laughs> <laughs> but I had no idea what that meant at that time. What does it mean for God to speak to us? So I had this whole thing that was sort of developing over here and this very good experience, this relationship with this man. I was sort of living the college life over here and studying computer science and planning out my future. and. Uh, and I was also doing a, a little bit, as I mentioned, my, my cousin was into a little bit of Zen and uh, Taoism, these kinds of things. I had some of these uh, sources in my life and was reading a little here, a little there. My, uh, my brother, independent of me, made his own journey into Christianity and uh, also ended up uh, backfilling a few things for me in terms of making some of these connections between like, you know, Zen and Christianity. Um, but the, you know, it's very interesting. I, I've, I've discovered now, it's come back around many years later, but the, the Tao Te Ching, which is, you know, one of the three major Chinese uh, philosophy religions, really the Tao, Lao Tzu is kind of like Plato. So it's really to see it as a philosophical system that just happens to have, uh, well, it doesn't really have religious, it's really like Plato. I mean. Mm. Uh, and in some ways, a little bit closer to Christianity than uh, than some of the Greek philosophy is. Mm -hmm. But it was it was kind of captivating because it opened me to something transcendent, which mm. was really missing in my life. Well, anyway, after studying through Genesis, we jumped ahead to the prologue of John's Gospel. Uh, interestingly, in some Chinese translations, they will say in the beginning w uh, of the Bible, in the beginning was the Tao. Hmm. And so some of these things that were already beginning to percolate about transcendence and a different worldview, some of this stuff, I found uh, landed in, in Christianity and the sort of mystical that also became flesh, the, the word through whom all things were made became flesh. This just captured me. And I thought, oh, okay, Christianity has everything. Everything's here. So... And there was a grace, you know, a grace I wish I could bottle and, uh, mm -hmm. and give to every other unbeliever. But, but it was really in that moment, I had been doing this Bible study thinking, like, if God exists, if the Bible is true, then the answer to this question is, and, and I made a very concrete decision at that point, God does exist, the Bible is true. I'm dropping the conditionals. It's quite a leap. I mean, to, to go to, to believe that God exists is one thing, to believe that the Bible is true is another. How did you arrive at that conclusion? Well, finding 
Uh, so all of this had been really building over this year of, of Bible study and accepting this as a, a reasonable uh, philosophy, I suppose, a mm -hmm. reasonable approach to life. And then sort of seeing these other threads that were compelling to me, mm -hmm. uh, fulfilled in Christianity. Mm. So I was, willing to, uh, I was willing to take a step forward and say, I think this is what I'm looking for. I'm willing to jump in I like that. And, and start living it out. You're familiar with um, Henry Newman's illative sense, are you? The, well, I mm. think it's the idea you've got these kind of converging strands of proofs, you know, may, maybe none of mm. which is sufficient. Uh, I think the example he uses is most people in England accept the shape of England, though nobody's actually walked it. Mm. But you have these different uh, things, uh, maps and what people tell you are satellite images, etc. And you just come to believe something, even though you might not be able to justify any of those things. But I, I like what you said there, that it was just this acceptance. You had to at some point make the leap. Yeah, yeah and, and very consciously and... Uh, I was I was convinced enough to to take a step forward and begin living inside of it rather than watching it from the outside, and and it was really at that point that I thought, well, I guess I need to do like the Christian thing now uh, and do something on Sunday, mm -hmm. and at that point I thought, well, uh, I I just had this sense that Catholicism was the whole thing, and without having studied that very extensively, um, I thought, well. Other people might be doing other things, but seems watered down, seems mm. reduced, seems, you know, I'm going to start going to Mass. Wow. What did your folks think about this? <laughs> Were they aware? <laughs> well, my, uh, by this time, my brother had been baptized, I guess. And so, and my, my parents, the same time my brother and I started looking into things, my parents started going to a Methodist church. Hmm. Uh, my, my mother had always had this desire to do something and, and had felt some guilt about not having something to share with her boys. And uh, at one point formed something like a prayer that was, well, maybe my boys will find something and share it with me. Yeah, which Interesting. Uh, Yeah, was amazingly fulfilled, it seems. Could I share with you a little poem here? By mm. It's not long, it's by Sheldon Van Ocken. He wrote A Severe Mercy, he was a friend of Lewis. Mm. Uh, it was a Catholic, I believe. And anyway, this, this, what you just said sounded like this, and it's so beautiful. He's talking about making that choice to believe. And he says, Between the probable and proved, there yawns a gap. Afraid to jump, we stand absurd. Then see behind us sink the ground and worse, our very standpoint crumbling. Desperate dawns, our only hope to leap in... To, th to leap into the word that opens up the shuttered universe. Mm, wow, that's beautiful. <laughs> that's powerful that's for you great. too. Isn't that glorious? <laughs> yeah, just yeah. this idea that it's like, if I don't make a decision, I'm making a decision. Yeah, yeah, that's and, right. Yeah, that's not that's a good right. one. Yeah. yeah, I can't say that I had, I had, I felt a lot of freedom. I mean, the, the Lord was so patient with me and, and I never felt, uh, I never felt pushed. I never felt pressured, you mm. know, I just, Felt a lot of freedom to to take steps and um, and and slowly discover. You know, if I could summarize my two objections to Christianity from uh, the the beginning of my journey, it's that Christians were too stupid to figure things out on their own, and so they made up a god. Mm -hmm. And Christians were too too weak to deal with their own problems, and so they had to have a god to to call it, cry out to. And I think, really, I think, what's the, funny is I think there's. The first half of both of those statements are true. Well, that's exactly <laughs> what I came to. I yeah. mean, that was, and the, and the Lord never hit me over the head with that. He allowed me to just very slowly discover the limits of my own mind and the limits of my own strength. And that was really the kind of the next breakthrough. I was studying in Germany uh, about a year after this experience with the Gospel of John. And I had started going to Mass, gone to Mass every weekend, and... Uh, I would have become, I would have just come into RCIA, but I was doing, I studied the spring semester in Germany, so I knew I'd be away during Easter, and I thought, well, I'll just oh, I'll come back to Pennsylvania. So you're going to Holy Mass, but not receiving Eucharist. That's and right. Getting to know people there, presumably, That's or right. standing yep. in the back? Um, no, I, I sort of waited mm. in. The, the girl I was dating was also a Catholic. So that helps. she, uh, yeah, you know, so I knew where Mass was, okay. and uh, we went together many times. Um, but in Germany, I really ran into the, 
the, the limits of my own strength and was just stretched enough taking graduate classes in, in German and computer science and mathematics and, uh, and felt really far away from home and, and just disconnected and really cried out to God for my weakness for the first time. And, and it was in the wake of that that I, I finally had an answer to the question that I had asked the other college students. You talk to God and then does he talk back? And, and recognizing his presence, and it wasn't a you know, sort of extraordinary phenomenon in any way. I didn't hear audible voices or see anything, but, but recognize that still small voice that was amazingly familiar. And yet for the first time I recognized that it was the voice of God who was uh, speaking to me in his own obscure ways that, that keep us free. But anyway, it was, uh, it was in the midst of that experience that I started thinking about giving my life to sharing that gift of prayer for the first time. What year were you when you entered RCIA? So I came back after that experience in Germany. I was a senior in college. What, what year was that? Oh, uh, well, it would have been 19, the year 96, 97 okay. school year. Well, yeah. well. So I was baptized in 97. Wow. And what was the RCIA experience like for you? Um, not great. Yeah, I, uh, <laughs> yeah. I, yeah, I, uh, I had had such a rich experience. I was already going out fishing for college students at this point. Uh, uh, no, nobody ever took me up on it, but, you know, hmm. I had the, the courage, uh, the nervous courage to, to go and ask people to study the Bible with me Beautiful. on a uh, Penn State campus. And, and, and my experience of faith, of, of praying spontaneously with people, uh, even discerning, listening to God, having mm. a sense of His presence, uh, all of these things were so developed. And, and the RCIA was, was a little bit uh, flat at mm. that time. So, Were you going through it with anyone else? Yeah, there were eight of us baptized. And were there intellectual seekers like yourself or not really? Mm, not the same. Mm, yeah, It's got to be hard. Yeah. So a few of the catechists, the student catechists there uh, were some beautiful people and actually introduced me to the charismatic renewal. Beautiful. That became a, a thread of my story mm. in that time. The, uh, yeah, the, uh, some, of the cat some of the students were really great witnesses of faith and kind of full-hearted, full-bodied people. And to be honest, I needed a little bit more of that than the intellectual stuff I'm the to, same to as balance you. some yeah, things out. Yeah, that was out. where I was at as well. Yeah. One thing I loved, and I know people can criticize the charismatic renewal and maybe justly in certain instances, but one thing I loved about my charismatic friends is that they acted as if God existed and was working now. Right, right. It wasn't just a sort of philosophical yeah. system I had to adhere to. It was a relationship that was actually active now and uh yeah and that really corresponded with what i had experienced in germany and the sense that i was living under i mm. i got so excited about that when i made the connection when i was in germany that i started asking god about everything like mm. should i take a, a left to go to class today or should i take a right should i have ham for dinner or <laughs> turkey you know <laughs> just like asking him about everything and then i kind of Ham. Okay. All right. Good. We'll Always. Do, we'll do, do God ham. would never suggest turkey. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But yeah, very much uh, f found a resonance with that in the in the charismatics. Were your friends uh, put off by the fact that you not only become a Christian but a Catholic? Yeah. You know, well, that was um, a chapter. I I tend to be a little bit conflict averse, and so I, I didn't bring that up right away. I just kind of kept doing the Bible study and. Um, they knew I was going to Mass, and, uh, they, you know, they had a Sunday. I also went to their Sunday worship service quite a bit, and, and they, that, the group at Penn State in particular was more Catholic-friendly than some of the other groups. The, the head of that group uh, had grown up Catholic, had never really rejected the church, just kind of didn't get it, wandered away, met the Bible study group, and then uh, had really found a place there. Mm. So I remember him talking about lauding John Paul II as being a great missionary, for example. So there was something that was kind of Catholic mm -hmm. friendly there. Um, yeah. But when I eventually told David that I was going to be baptized uh, mm. in a couple months, uh, he started to you know question that decision. And it wasn't until Holy Thursday that we had met for a Bible study and he said, uh, you know, I, I've been really trying to figure out how to express this to you. And I, I think this is it. I, if you're baptized Catholic, I think you really need to commit yourself to ministry in the Catholic Church. Because I basically was 
doing ministry with the University Bible Fellowship and kind of moving on that track and then sort of sacramentally becoming Catholic. And he was seeing this, you know, like do one or the other. And he said, you're going to be a leader wherever you go, but I think you need to make that decision before you're baptized, you know, make a commitment up front one way or the other. And he said, and really, I bless your decision. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, so, so I really wrestled with that. I, I just skipped all my classes for the day, spent the day in prayer. I went to talk to the priest on campus and had a nice chat. Uh, ironically, being here in Steubenville now, he had mentioned uh, Scott Hahn and he could see because I, what I really hadn't experienced was in anything evangelical in the Catholic Church. And he could see that in me, a desire to share the faith. I mean, that was really the, this driving thing that happened in me. And he said, well, you know, a lot of people have brought in the gifts of the Protestant church into the Catholic church. You know, we really grow from That's that. That's what I was just talking about a moment ago. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So he encouraged me and he said, you know, ultimately you have to make the decision. And uh, so uh, prayed with me a little bit and then I went on my way. It should have been a sign to me that I was drawn to go. I walked to the church downtown. I wanted to pray in the church. And uh, as I was kneeling there, and interestingly, you know, I had... I had sort of gotten the Eucharist, but it wasn't anything I had struggled with. And so there was a way, I suppose, that I hadn't gotten it. Uh, I had just gone to Mass several times. We moved from John 1 eventually to John 6. I read John 6. I thought, oh, that's what's going on at Mass. And I just kind of moved on and didn't really like reflect on what that meant. Although I was very aware of not receiving communion. So all of those things were in me, and I was, I was looking at the tabernacle, I was praying, and I just said, Lord, I just want to do whatever you want me to do. And then I saw the, the light on the, uh, the, the flame and the, the uh, vigil candle, the tabernacle candle, just flared up for a moment. And I don't think anything extreme, but it's just, you know, the timing of these things, right? Mm -hmm. So that I was looking there, that I noticed that, it flashed, and then these words came to me, I want you to fan the flame of my church. And so that really resonated and, and moved me. And then as I moved away from, I, I went to walk back to campus, then the thought of not receiving the sacraments started to go through. And I thought, well, that's ridiculous. Maybe I could put this off a little bit longer. I had been going to mass for basically two years and hadn't received communion. Maybe I could do another six months or something. But and I thought, never in my life being baptized, well, I would have been baptized in this other UBF probably, but never in my life receiving Holy Communion, never receiving the Sacrament of Confession, never being confirmed. Mm. Well, this is clearly not an option. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, so then the decision went forward and on Holy Thursday, already with a sense of, if I'm going to commit myself to this, it's, it's a real commitment to serve and to give myself to the to the church. So mm -hmm. I had already been thinking about priesthood for nine months before this, and that desire to move forward with the vocation was, was really strong at that point. Did you discern any other religious orders? Well, I didn't even know what a monk was. Uh, although the, the campus ministers were monks, I didn't really quite make the connection. I don't know. Maybe they didn't preach about it. They also wore clerics as mm -hmm. well as they, uh, the, the one uh, wore his habit also. But, um, but they had a uh, the, the director of campus ministry brought students to St. Vincent every semester, and that happened to be the weekend after Easter. So he invited me to come along on my first vocation visit a week after I was baptized. Mm. And, and on the one hand, I thought, well, I'm not called to be a monk. I'm called to, to evangelize. This is uh, really this desire to share the faith is this strong thing in me. Mm -hmm. uh, but then when I got to St. Vincent, I experienced the community. I saw the outreach and uh, just really felt a, a strong uh, connection there. I then went to World Youth Day a couple months later. Whereabouts? And, uh, in Paris. Okay, and, yes. And... Uh, and got to see the Universal Church. And I also read my first biography of a saint, which was Chesterton's biography of St. Francis. Oh, excellent. I fell in love with St. Francis. Yes. I asked about authentic Franciscans, <laughs> and someone directed me to the CFRs. Yes. So I uh, visited the CFRs. I loved the CFRs. Uh, I wanted to be a CFR. And God wanted me to go to St. Vincent and be a Benedictine. Uh -huh. And uh, it was really a very strong experience <clears throat> in prayer that I just couldn't deny that the Lord was, was directing me to be a Benedictine. So hmm. 
I joined the Benedictines and uh, it seems to be working out. Beautiful. Tell us, let's talk about prayer a little bit and maybe we can begin just sort of from the, the you know, the, the the, the understanding that prayer is difficult and that we, we try to pray. We're not really sure how to pray. We're not really sure how we ought to be feeling when we pray. Uh, we hear people like you talk about prayer and just sort of suspect that maybe you're one of these special individuals that's able to pray while the rest of us have to sort of muddle our way through, I don't know, you know, something opposite to heartfelt devotions and things like that. And I just, I'd love you to kind of help us here. I know you've written a book on this topic. Remind us what that is. Uh, Personal Prayer, A Guide for Receiving the Father's Love. And and, And, uh, yeah, let's put a link in the description below to that. That's with the St. Paul Center, correct? So St. Paul Center, what's the URL, Joseph? Just go to stpaulcenter.com. stpaulcenter.com. Okay, Personal Prayer. You and your spiritual father wrote this. Father Thomas Acklin. That's right. Cool. Yeah. What was that like writing this book? Because it's not a small book. I mean, it's a book on personal prayer. But I I started reading it and was very and am very much enjoying it and plan to continue. Yeah, it's uh it's the second book that we wrote together. Mm-hmm. We wrote a book on spiritual direction before that, a guide for sharing the Father's love, and uh, it was a beautiful experience uh, writing both books. My my spiritual director is. Uh, 70 years old and has been at this uh, giving spiritual direction, obviously living a life of deep prayer for a long time. In spiritual direction, he formed me uh, as a spiritual director and also gave me spiritual direction. Everything we talked about, I understood from the inside. And so I was really able, he did a lot of talking, I did a lot of notes, and then I folded my thoughts and his thoughts together. Mm. Everything he said, I understood. And we, it was very, it was a beautiful experience. As we started to write the book on prayer, also a very beautiful experience, but he's a different kind of person. He's a, a little bit more melancholic. He says he has no imagination. Hmm. Uh, I, I, I keep pushing him on that. I have a hard time <laughs> believing that. But anyway, uh, I'm a very imaginative person. I'm uh, a little more phlegmatic, a uh, little more uh, f- a buoyant personality, I suppose. and. And so I found that our, our experience of prayer was, uh, was quite different. Interesting. And, and so, uh, so I think it made a really rich uh, combination, uh, complementarity. Mm. The, the thread that really holds it together is, is relationality. And, and what we try to do in that book, and, and I think we're relatively successful, is on the one hand, talk about prayer for, in objective terms. And I, I've read a lot of the, the masters on prayer and things in the East and things in the West and Carmelite and Passionist and Dominican and uh, really try to fold these things, Franciscan, uh, Benedictine, obviously. And, uh, and I love all of that. I love to learn. I love to get all of that and, and be able to teach things that are sort of trustworthy and in the tradition, <clears throat> but then also to really bring it down to experience. And, and what's this like? It's one thing to use all of these words, but then what's the actual experience of that from the inside? And, and that's where I think that Father Tom and me with uh, different experiences in some way that go along with the, the way that we're made humanly, um, but then obviously a, a similarity in experience has, uh, was really valuable. And the, and the couple of pieces that we pick up on are, well, really the, the dimension of relationality, that developing a relationship with God. And that's where we can draw from our human relationships. Mm. So I've had a chance to spend several hours with you today. Mm-hmm. And as we get to know each other and, and share with each other and the conversation opens up and the more vulnerably that we share, mm. then the more interiority is opened up and the more intimacy that can yes. develop. Yes. And the same thing is true in prayer. And so the, that's really good. The, the thing is to find those ways and, and, and what draws the vulnerability out from us? Well, trust. Yeah. And, and in you were going to say something else. I'm sorry. Well, no, I, the obvious, certainly trust. Uh, and like I will bear myself to you. You know, if you and I got to know each other and became friends, I would begin to unfold my interior life to you, but only if I trusted that you would try well to receive it. That's right. And that's only going to happen with time. So there's no substitute hmm. for time. Oh, that's good. And, and that, it also, that, uh, just, just to pause on that for a moment, that, that's an interesting point as I've just moved here to Franciscan and I'm trying to you know, in, in, in get these nice relationships, try to encourage these good relationships. So we have this little get together on Sundays after Holy Mass. And we've got a few different people we're having potlucks with and things like this. But yeah, there's no substitute for history. 
you know, I've got some old friends in Atlanta who I love, and, mm. and you want so desperately to be there already with these new people that you're meeting, but you need more than just a few deep conversations. It, it, it's almost like this familiarity as well as sharing each other's life leads to this intimacy. So I just made that connection there, but just like in friendship, there's no Beautiful. substitute for time and history. Yeah. That's really interesting with prayer too. Well, and naturally we, we tend to meet each other and show our, you know the best side off. Yes. Uh, yeah. So I'm, I'm telling you all of the best things that I know the most about. I mean, <laughs> yeah. it's, anyway, trying to also be hum humble and vulnerable in, mm. uh, in talking with you now and as we get to know each other. But, but we do that with God, too. You know, we like to come with our pre-scripted texts that are safe, and we, we do that. We do the kind of right thing. We, we show God the best thing. We ignore all of the parts of our life that are embarrassing and limited, and we sort of hope they go away on their own. Mm. And uh, we don't really want to bring them into this relationship. And for a prayer to go deeper, we've got to learn how to do all that. Mm. Uh, and, and silence is really helpful with that. When we're, when we're sort of stuck there, there's nothing like spending a couple hours in the Adoration Chapel and allowing all the stuff to come up and the discomfort and then to pay attention to what the discomfort is and what's the thing I don't want to show them and what am I trying so hard to run from and hold back. And, and this is, this is why it's so difficult to come up with a sort of structure, like here's how to pray. You do X, Y, and Z because <laughs> right. I love how you put that, like all this embarrassing stuff that I hope will just go away on its own and we can forget about. But there's no prayer book that explicitly shares with you how to deal with your junk right. and history and bring that forth before the Father. It, it just it requires that sort of vulnerability, which, yeah, cool. That we, I, which I guess structured prayer can lead us to. That's right. Well, and I mean, again, I think the relational analogy is so helpful. I mean, so give me the formula for a relationship. Me? You want me to do that now? <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking of it as far as like a dating relationship, you know, like uh, I get to know my wife. We start to spend time together. Uh, we, start to, we start to desire to be with each other more intentionally. So and you then have, we decide to give ourselves to each you other. You have some right? structure up front, but yeah. at the same time, there's no, you know, you know that there's no dating guide in the Bible, for example, mm. right? I mean, there's, there's something that's sort of human, cultural, personal. Mm. You, you can't really have a, you know, there's some real basic steps. And that's about as much as you get in terms of structured prayer as well. You get some basic steps. You got to show up. Mm -hmm. You got to spend some time. Here are a couple of good starting lines, you know, some pickup lines, <laughs> right? You know, you yeah. can start to woo God a little bit. And uh, yeah, so there are some real basic structural things, but ultimately it becomes very personal. And then every relationship is different. Yes, yes. And, and, and the same with every human relationship yeah, I think with God. Just like a married couple might fall, you know, into being discouraged when they look at other couples and think, gosh, we should be more like them. Maybe not right, realizing right. that God has given them their own personality and their own mission. I think my wife and I have like dealt with that a little bit. You know, we're both kind of louder personalities and you'll sometimes meet these other couples who are very quiet and soft-spoken and organized. You think, gosh, that looks great. What are we doing wrong? What are we doing wrong? <laughs> Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So we're always tempted to look at that other guy in the adoration chapel that seems to have it all together and is, you know, all composed. And there's a there's a saying to, to bring in monasticism for a moment that the, the novices, the first year guys look holy, but aren't the the next phase. The juniors don't look holy and aren't <laughs> the seniors don't look holy, but are. Oh, glory to and, God. And, isn't that beautiful? And isn't it true with marriage too, well, It's so right? true. You meet an older couple who you're like, they don't look like they're trying that hard. But if the <laughs> two of them are joyful, they must be. Right. Um, and it is true. Like a lot of our movies center around that initial stage of love. It's that romantic yeah. love, not the kind of companionship love that's born out over the years of trust and intimacy. That's often not celebrated. These aren't usually what movies are based around. Yeah. But this is where we all want to end up if we're doing it right. You and I were talking about your conversion a little bit before the, before the show. And uh, I think it's those early stages. We're good at talking about it in the movies, and we're not good at talking about it in the faith. Mm. It's also a beautiful stage, that falling in love stage. Good, yes. There's, uh, you know, there's something when that experience of the Lord breaks through, mm. when we... You know, and you, you had shared with me uh, about World Youth Day, and I have also my, uh, my Germany story. I also have a, a Paris story. Having desired priesthood, it was in Paris that I 
was praying in front of the Blessed Sacrament and for the first time felt like I heard the Lord calling me to that. I knew it was mm. my desire. Everybody told me it's your first fervor, everything's <laughs> exciting. And I had to accept that. I mean, I, what do I know? But uh, it was really an adoration for the first time. I felt like, as I said to the Lord, I want to do whatever you want me to do. And, and I, I heard in my heart, I want you to be a priest. And I was so excited. But those, those heady moments and that falling in love, there's a place for that in our faith. Too. I love that because we do tend to sometimes put that down, don't we? Like, well, that's just the passionate and you can't trust your feelings and you have to go with what you know. And surely that has to mature like any relationship. But there's something about those moments that makes us really vulnerable. We're really willing to put all the pieces on the table. We're mm. really willing to, to spill our whole hearts and to commit everything. We want to, uh, we want to go on the journey. We want to engage the Lord. We want to take him at his word. And those are, those are beautiful moments of mm. faith and moments that get renewed at different times. But mm -hmm. the, that dimension of experience is so important. And then that has to move into a place of, of regularity because what tends not to come out, well, maybe it comes out a little bit in those moments, but there's a whole bunch of our, our junk that uh, tends not to come out in those moments. And it's only through the, the long haul oh. as, <laughs> as the, we get to know each other that we can't keep that stuff down. Yeah, if I had known the kind of junk that would have come up in my marriage due, due to our marriage, I would have, I don't think I would have got married. Like it would have scared me too much. And you, you just can't hide it. You can't run from it. But that's the stuff. That's where the Lord wants to meet you in those places, eh? Yeah. That's where you're the most real. And there's something so mm. terribly lovely about being your worst and being loved in that. Yes. My goodness. Yes. Oh my gosh, if my wife can stand me in my worst, our blessed <laughs> Lord might be able to. And, well, and, and that's why marriage versa. is a sacrament, right? Yeah. You're really encountering God's love for you and her. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Beautiful. Yeah, I was thinking this recently too. Like the, lo the lovely thing about growing in self-knowledge is that no matter what somebody says against you, it pales in comparison <laughs> to what you already know to be true about yourself. Is that yourself. the worst you can do? Are you kidding me? You have no idea how depraved I I've am. I've accused myself of much worse. <laughs> and I, I was with these, uh, these uh, Byzantine monks in Wisconsin. I'm not sure if They're you know great. the Holy I Resurrection, do. maybe? Yep. I spent an eight-day silent retreat there last mm, year. Beautiful. And one of the monks made this good point. He said, he said well, if, if you want to see how the... Uh, uh, what did he say? How the amateurs sin. Go to Vegas. <laughs> Fornication, <laughs> drinking. If you want to see how the grown-ups sin, come to a monastery. <laughs> Backbiting, envy, arrogance, pride. I thought that was such that's a hilarious. beautiful thing to say. Yeah, yeah, because that's the stuff. Grown-up sins. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But okay, so showing up, being regular mm -hmm, in, in our encountering of the Lord and yeah, I think sometimes people are afraid that we are psychologizing the faith when we start talking about things like junk and issues and baggage, you know, especially as we apply uh, psychological terms to these things. I think there is this fear. Oh, wait a minute. Like this is not how this is not how the early fathers spoke. This is or at least that's the perception. And so therefore, I should try to get back to that more archaic language because that was when people lived the faith for real. Do you, do you agree with that? And what do you think of it? I think generally the problem, we have this, this tension, uh, even in the interpretation of St. Thomas, of a kind of conceptualist view. Uh, all of these things are dogmatic statements given from the top down, and uh, we just have to work with them as they are. And then the transcendental Thomists were really focused on the dimension of truth that comes through an experience. And we tend to flop to one side or the other. The conceptualist view is a lot safer. We can just work with all of the, the dogmas in their pristine purity. We don't mm -hmm. sully them by our own human experience. Uh, it's all correct. And, and there's a beauty to it as well. I mean, I love that. I, mean, I love Gary Goulagrange mm -hmm. and, and love reading how these things fit together. And he's, you know, but the, the other view that there is truth that comes through in the experience, that there's something that's like this It's like this, it's like this uh, conflict or supposed conflict between phenomenology and Thomism, right? Is that kind of yeah, what you're referring yeah. to? So you can, you, the, the real goal is to hold these things in tension. Yeah, there is a telos, and then there's my experience of the world. That, it, that's it, right. So that the, the psychological language is, is really getting at that language of experience. And, and there's something that, 
you know, so how do I, what is it, what does a grace feel like? You know, it's nice to talk about actual graces and sanctifying graces. And it's like, but what, what difference does this make in my life? Yes. You know, this is what I'm interested in. Yes. I don't want to get rid of sanctifying grace and actual grace. I just want to know like how it, how it how interacts with me, it, yes. how I experience it. And so that's where the psychological language is helpful for putting words to the, the concepts in terms of my experience. The, the Desert Fathers certainly did that, and, you know, I mean, St. Saint, uh, Saint John Cashin, who becomes a bridge, the uh, Anthony of Egypt, all of these, uh, the Eastern monasticism was translated into Latin and brought to the West through uh, Cashin, John Cashin's conferences and institutes. Leo the Great had sent him over to gather up the monastic wisdom, and he brought that over, and then that becomes a foundation for St. Benedict 100 years later. But... Uh, it's really, it's very psychological language. It's, you know, it's using its own sort of Greek foundations and vocabulary. You can talk about the noose and the pneuma and the psyche and the, the pathe and the logosmoi and the, you know, all of these other things. You put Greek names to them, but ultimately it's talking about distractions. It's talking about my interior, about passions. It's uh, uh, about the psyche, my interface with the world, where I am interiorly. So, so there's a way to marry these languages. I mean, mm -hmm. psychology has done a great service in really studying the human person and trying to tease these things out. Uh, although, Thomas, you know, the treatise on the passions is the biggest part of the Summa and, and is one of the most overlooked. And so there's, there's a lot mm -hmm. of richness in the tradition looking at, at human interiority and, mm. and trying to fit some of these things together. And I suppose we can only use language that makes sense to us. Like if I'm trying to explain my experience of shame or embarrassment or coming before the Lord and asking him to come into those areas, even that language I'm just using now, like come into this part of me, shine your light, heal, untwist. I mean, I can only, if I want my faith to be meaningful, I can only use language that is meaningful. That's right. I, I can adopt a different sort of vocabulary to sound different, but unless I'm saying what I mean, this is not really a personal relationship that I'm engaging in. That's you know? right. And I suppose this language that we're using now is going to sound archaic 300, 3,000 <laughs> years from now <laughs> anyway. So. Yeah. Yeah, but is this the first time you've encountered that objection? The psychological babble, you know, all this wound stuff and untwist, you know? No, no, certainly. And it, we, use, uh, we use the language of vulnerability quite a bit. And, and that seems to be, it's something that people really hmm. hold on to. I remember even early on, I, uh, right after I was ordained a priest in 2004, I was sent back to Penn State where I was able to be a chaplain for three years and then also continue studying computer science. But uh, as a chaplain, I was a spiritual director for a number of the students. And I, I'll never forget one of my uh, directees saying, after I said something about vulnerability again, he goes, it's all about the V word, isn't it? And I hadn't realized I was using it that much or that it had been so thematized already in my own mind. But that's something that Father Tom and I bring out quite a bit and that people really hold on to. When we taught our spiritual direction course at the Vita Consecrata Institute, there's a great uh, Norbertine priest, Father Thomas Nelson, who's uh, steeped in a lot of good things uh, and conceptualist Thomism, among other things. But he, uh, he said, vulnerability is a very psychological word, isn't it? And he said, what, what would that translate into in, you know, the, in, in, the, in the concept, in the tradition? Where, where does that fit? And, uh, and I've thought about that. I'd be open to your ideas. I, the, the best that I've come up with, it's certainly connected to humility mm. in the sense of that honesty of mm. self-revelation. But, but humility doesn't require another. I think vulnerability always requires another. So it's like Ooh. humility in relationship. Yes. And I don't know where that is in the tradition other than just sticking those two concepts together. Humility is obviously very strong and throughout everything, <laughs> but humility is not necessarily in relationship. And I think that's one of the real gifts even as, uh, you know, John Paul II sort of expanded what image and likeness of God means from just intellect and will to intellect and will and relationship. To be in the image and likeness of God is to be in relationship. It's he, male and female he made them. In his image and likeness he made them. And so John Paul II really introduces that dimension in his personalism, in his theology of the body. And so I think that the relationality like that. that has really come to fruition 
uh, in our time is is a beautiful thing. And you know, even if you don't find that explicitly in some of the tradition, when you read Teresa of Avila, I just read her. Um St- st- not seven story mansion that's what's his name mountain yeah, the interior castle. interior castle thank yeah. you i mean humility is like every sentence it, it's incredible it's like be humble or go to hell be yeah. humble and you can't go to hell yeah. it, it's it's so well, it's amazing. foundational yeah but also like i guess what i was getting at is you see her intimacy with the lord yeah that intimacy yeah, yeah. we long for and that vulnerability right, right. even if she doesn't and I haven't read all of her works, but even if she doesn't teach you how to do that, she's expressing right. it in how she talks to our blessed Lord. And yeah. there's those charming anecdotes about her wagon wheel That's falling great. off. And she says to the Lord, if this is how you treat your friends, it's no wonder you don't have many. <laughs> you know, so there's, it's shown in those personal. That's right. And that, that relationality with the Lord only develops if we also have that relationality with other human beings. Really? Uh, we, we learn relationality from our human relationships. Mm-hmm. And then uh, now our wow. relationship with the Lord is not merely a projection or a summation, or, but, but we learn to relate. We learn to be vulnerable. We learn to be loved. We learn to feel, to receive. To, we learn all of that from human relationships. And, and it develops and grows in human relationships. This is one of the nice uh, complementarities, parallelisms between a book on spiritual direction and a book on personal prayer. The relationship that gets lived out in spiritual direction in radical vulnerability makes it possible and, and enhances. There's a, there's a mutual reinforcing. Mm-hmm. My relationship with the Lord is not the same as my relationship with my spiritual director, but the vulnerability that I practice in one scenario overflows mm-hmm. into the other scenario. So I'm, I immediately went to the negative of that, whereas like if, if human intimacy or intimacy with God is based on intimacy with others, you can see why... You know, your negative relationships with your family or your parents or your siblings or your spouse can interfere with that. You know, maybe you've shown too much of who you are to somebody and it wasn't received and it wasn't welcomed and they showed disgust and they left. Yeah. And then you've got to deal with that. And how do you bring that to the Lord if that's what you've learned? Yeah. And, and certainly there's a lot of that going on in people's prayer lives where they have ideas of God that are not God. Uh, so, again, our relationship with God is... Uh, can can grow beyond our human relationship. Sometimes it's experienced in the negative. You know, uh, every father is a failure, right? No father is God, and and so we experience both in the successes of our fathers and in the failures of our fathers, mm. kind of held up against divine revelation. Mm. Uh, we recognize something in our heart that wasn't met by our father, and if we can acknowledge the truth of what's in our heart, of a way that. You know, maybe mm. he didn't see me, he wasn't there for me, he didn't help me, he you know, ha- didn't have time for me, whatever it was. Mm. But I sort of know in my heart that that wasn't right. Yes. And in the process of forgiving him, I'm also opening to uh. what God wants to provide for me. So, but it's still in reference to human relationships. Those, those human relationships make it possible for us to really grow in our relationship with God. So is this why... <clears throat> A monk shouldn't be a hermit too quickly. Like I would imagine. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. That's I right. don't know any hermits, but I would imagine either they, you know, come back into the world absolutely nuts, just crazy, or saints. Like, how do you remain alone with yourself for that long and come out normal? Yeah. I mean, you tell me because you've probably had experiences with hermits and taking extended periods of time in solitude. Yeah, I. Uh I had the blessing this year of giving the retreat for the Kamaldolese monks who are who are down the road from here and who are hermits who they come together to pray the divine office and that's basically it. Otherwise, they're in solitude uh, all the time. See, I just think that would be so bad for me because <laughs> I, I only began to realize that some of my behaviors were passive aggressive or manipulative yeah, yeah. or whatever, based on how my wife started to react that's to them. Right. Like, oh, wow, I do that. I'm so sorry I do that. Whereas if I didn't have community, I wonder. Well, that's exactly what St. Benedict says in the different kinds of monks. He says that the the hermit vocation is after someone has been tried and tested Mm. in the uh, the context of the community of the Chinobium. So, yeah, very much exactly your insight that that needs to be drawn out of us in order to really face that and refine those things. Otherwise, we end up worshiping ourselves, really. I mean, mm. uh, which is also a good definition of hell. 
<laughs> so probably the pain, well, God's blessing, wow. the pain of the hermitage as we worship such a limited creature in ourselves <laughs> wow. pushes us to not maintain the vocation. But when we recognize that we're just so poor mm. and we're so broken, we're such a mess, and yet we're so loved, and we can really forget about ourselves and, and focus on him and give him the, uh, the shreds of our mm. humanity, that's when the more solitude as possible. Mm. So back to this eight-day silent retreat I took last year. I wonder if you can help me gain some insight into this. I um, was really excited about it. had a wonderful time. Um, I had a friend reach out to me recently, and they said, I know you took an eight-day. What would your suggestion be? And I said, which I think is good advice, you know, don't be a perfectionist about it. Just show up and allow our Lord to do what he wants to do. <sighs> And so with that in mind, I even took like a, a novel. I took a cigar for each day, you know. So I wasn't like, <laughs> I wasn't, and I also took Teresa of Avila and some people. There was a lot of prayer involved. But I remember like, the, I'd take a nap every day because there's not much to do. And I remember waking up like the second and the third day and this sadness descending upon me when I realized I still have bloody four days left. <laughs> five days left of this. I'm done, aren't I? I'm done. Just that, the awkwardness of being alone and there, there being no outlet for my I remember just wanting one of the monks to talk to me I was just so desperate you know for <laughs> human interaction um, and it was weird you know noticing that stuff within you which you wouldn't notice yeah, unless yeah, yeah. you were to That's go true. into solitude yeah yeah and and when we realize that God loves that stuff mm. so we get sick of mm. ourselves thank God we get sick of ourselves but he doesn't he loves us and and we can open that stuff up to him, and mm. uh, it's a you know certainly a point. Oh, I, gee, that's nice. yeah. A real uh, a real point of conversion was a, a similar period. I it was just when I had switched to uh, Father Tom for spiritual direction. I was making my deacon retreat, and I went to the the Passionist Nuns in Pittsburgh, and uh, so we prayed the Divine Office. They fed us meals, and I asked Father Tom. I was like, well, what what do you want me to you know, should I like bring a book on this or, you know, on deacons, maybe some deacon saints, I have all these ideas. And he's like, um, the best thing to do would be just to spend as much time as you can in front of the Blessed Sacrament. Hmm. <laughs> I thought, I don't know how that's going to work out. <laughs> hmm. uh, so, I, so I took him at his word. I just stayed in the chapel with nothing Oof. for five days, basically. And uh, Ooh, yeah, you really work. <laughs> Doing right. nothing is hard work. Yeah, when you're intentional that, about it, is, isn't that amazing? Yeah, it was uh, Pascal who said all of the world's evils can be boiled down to the fact that man does not know how to sit alone in a dark room <laughs> silently. That's right. It's uh, so profound. I would really encourage people to try that. It's like here's a litmus test. See how depressed you are. You know, turn off the phone. Turn off the music. Sit. What can I do? Nothing. Don't even yeah. don't even pick up the beads, maybe. Just yeah. sit. Whew, you, you come smack into your insufficiency. Yeah, yeah. I was never so unimpressed with myself mm. and really felt like, I, I don't know how to pray. I don't know what I'm doing. I, 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 can't, I don't know if I can just sit here. Uh, it's, it's really uncomfortable. I'm distracted by everything in this chapel. And, and, and fortunately, so I met with Father Tom... Uh, each night, and I was even I was too embarrassed even to share these things of of the mess that's I was so aware of what was happening inside of me and so unimpressed with it, like I got nothing. And fortunately, Father Tom, in his you know beautiful transparency, he started sharing a little bit of what he was experiencing. I'm like, yeah, yeah, that's it, and it gave me courage to start it talking was about. Or? Yeah, he was encountering his own poverty and in in his own ways, mm. but just uh, helped me to really see like, oh. Encountering my poverty is not a bad thing. It's a good thing. Hmm. Blessed are the poor in spirit. The kingdom of heaven is theirs. And, and it started my love relationship with poverty <laughs> and, and learning to love it in others and, and learning to let it be loved. And, and in that How does sense, that work practically? How do you love poverty in another? How has that happened recently with you? <sighs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, I like to say, you know, vulnerability is always lovable. When I when I see people who uh, who get insecure, they they don't know quite what to share. They're uh, struggling with finding their way. Um, gosh, I meet with uh, 
with, with so many people who, yeah, who just really run into the limits of themselves. Uh, married men who, who experience how poorly they love their, their wives or their children and just mm. very humbly manifest that. It's so lovable. It really is. And yeah, just such a, such yeah. a privilege. And that helps me to love it in myself too when I'm able to see, I feel what it's like to love it in someone else yeah, and then it, it gives me courage to believe that God could feel that yes. well, towards I, me. I have that experience as a father when I've seen my children become very <laughs> agitated, angry, embarrassed, awkward, um, mm. and I look on them and I'm like, "Oh God, I love you. I just yeah. think you're lovely," and I see them wanting to like escape my embrace or to be alone and they're just they're raging sometimes you know mm. not often but i mean those times where yeah. they're very upset over something and i look at them and I, they are completely acceptable to me in that moment like i love you i love you mm. and i just um you know you want to you want to kind of help them believe it and just sit with them in it and i suppose that's a nice analogy for prayer as the father Absolutely. looks upon us as we rage yeah and to not be afraid to do that in prayer rage if you need to rage hurt feel be honest bring your heart how does someone begin to pray you've touched upon it but let's just yeah. kind of circle this again for those who are like all right okay i want to pray how do i do it <laughs> it's funny because it's almost as natural as relationships right. so when somebody asks you the question you almost want to say exactly. you already know <laughs> yeah yeah no it's true i mean uh, but by doing it but uh, setting, setting the context, I guess, setting the environment is important. Uh, it's, it's nice to be able to do something like go to a church or go to an adoration chapel. And uh, that helps to set the context because our bodies also pray. Sometimes we make prayer too heady in activity and don't pay attention to what our bodies are doing. But you know, our, mm. what we see, what we feel, the, what we smell, the, our posture, these kinds of things matter you know, uh, without over-exaggerating, they, they do matter. And so, you know, going to an adoration chapel or, or finding a place in your home. I love the, we, I know we love the same Byzantine nuns. A uh, little shout out to the Christ the Bridegroom Monastery. But uh, I really learned from them about having a prayer corner, set up an icon, put a candle. And then even, I have a, my, I've got a ton of stuff in my office, but I have a prayer corner and I can just block out the rest of it. Just have an icon of, uh, of Jesus and Mary, not mm. uh, some, something like that one. And just look into the eyes of the, of the icon or in a chapel looking at the blessed sacrament helps to focus us a little bit and then i, I think there's a value to making it explicit what's it like you know you and i are sitting here together i know what that experience is, is, li is like imagine jesus really sitting there mm. it's not just imagination it's not make-believe my imagination is helping me to visualize an invisible reality he really is there uh, in the Blessed mm. Sacrament, he's really there in bodily form, but but in all times, he's really there with us. And so making that explicit, I think, is a, is a helpful starting point. And then even imagining ourselves just talking to him. I remember my uh, that year after I was baptized, I, I stayed at Penn State for a year. I started the graduate program in computer science after I was baptized and was kind of figuring out where to land in a religious order. And they would have adoration weekly and so I always made time uh, on Fridays and I collected things that I was aware of throughout the week like we're gonna have to talk about this you know I make a little note and then I just came before him and and started talking about these things like okay Lord uh, this is my thing and then I would stop and just imagine well what's he gonna say back to me now and now my imagination is not his voice but there's a way that I can make my imagination kind of wet clay that he can form in some way and uh, and then we, you know, just we can get into Ignatian things and whatever else to to start to distinguish between my voice and his voice and my imagination and his reality. But anyway, just starting to have that conversation, uh, or or even if you're some people are a journaler, you know, and you like to write something, write your part of the conversation and write his part of the conversation. And again, it's we're not becoming scribes for uh, for God in that way, but there's making it explicit, imagining. God actually spends time with me, loves me, and wants to talk with me. That already moves us forward in, in relationship. As the relationship goes on, things become more simple and 
things like sitting with him and being in silence and and that kind of grows naturally like it does in any human relationship but i think if people are really a, a beginner starting out more explicitly is uh, is helpful and and scripture is helpful in that way too just taking a passage from the gospel and uh you know you can open it randomly you can take the passage from daily mass you can take your favorite passage whatever it is it's always god's voice and uh, saint augustine says you know when we read scripture that god talks to us when we pray we talk to god mm. and so if we want to have a conversation with him which is ultimately the goal of prayer then uh, open up the open up the Bible and give him a chance to speak and really listen. What does this mean for my life? What is this revealing about God? Do I see the maybe the mercy of Jesus, His wisdom, His presence, His love, uh, and and imagine that? Let it be real for me, and and then begin to engage him that way. Hmm. You know, speaking of um, taking a little bit of the scripture and reading it. That's something I've been trying to do lately. And and I won't try to plow through several chapters. I'll even take like five sentences. Oh, yeah. And something just smashed me the other day that I didn't realize. And that is after Lazarus, after Christ r- raises him from the dead, they try to kill him. Did you know that? They tried to kill Lazarus after he rose from the dead. Like the man hasn't been through enough already. And they were trying to kill him because he was spreading the good news about Jesus. I had never read that before. Like I've read the Bible. It I doesn't mean, show up in the lectionary. Yeah. I don't think well, that line is in the it. lectionary. But but did you yeah. are you aware of this? Yeah. See, this is so funny. It's so it's such a smack in the face to me that I'm convinced that nobody could have been aware of that. That they actually try to kill Lazarus. I mean, the poor bugger. He just comes out of the tomb. Let me see if I can find it here. It's at the the end of John 11. Yeah, that's where I am right now. I think Jesus, a- therefore, no longer walked openly among the Jews, but went from there to the region near the wilderness, etc., etc. Yes, yeah, so they want to arrest Jesus, and they want to bloody kill Lazarus. <laughs> that just blew me away. But, yeah. It's amazing how we start to realize things within Scripture when we slow down. Yeah. Hey, talk to this for a second. There are a lot of people who watch this channel who are converting Protestants. We get lots of emails from people who are coming into the faith. And one of the things they say is they feel very overwhelmed by the cornucopia of devotions (laughs) that are at their disposal. And it's easy to become like really enthusiastic and you're praying all the chaplets and wearing all the scapulars. And this this can even be a real turn off to people as they as they get overwhelmed by it all. Um, So I guess speak to that and what role devotions can play in our prayer life. Well, and it's a it's a little bit funny asking a Benedictine about this because we're sort of known for not having devotions. Our devotion okay. is the liturgy. And <laughs> ah, I remember talking to a Dominican and he said, uh, yeah, I was asking a Benedictine, uh, what, what devotional prayers do you have? And he said, you mean like besides the liturgy? <laughs> <laughs> yes. So uh, we, we don't have a rosary. We don't have all the stuff. And we, I asked we, you that this morning and you got to give that answer. Why don't you wear a rosary, Father? Uh, we, uh, we predated the rosary by about 700 years. So <laughs> Okay. <laughs> But uh, but certainly devotional. I mean, popular piety. Piety is uh, is a word for love, right? Devotion is about love, and and as an expression of love for the Lord, uh, there there is something beautiful in in prayers that are kind of pre-constructed, and mm-hmm. normally words form inside of us and we express them. But uh, whether it's with the Scripture in the fullest sense, God's own word, or with devotional prayers, which are generally the words of saints. The words can be outside of us and then form what is inside of us. And mm-hmm. so uh, we can be formed by the, the prayers of others and the devotions of others. And, and it helps to flesh things out. Because the other thing, you know, I mean, people will, will read Scripture and, and have a hard time interfacing. I know it was hard for me. It's the, the language is a little different. The, mm-hmm. the expressions are different. The kinds of details we normally include in things aren't there in Scripture. And these other details are there. And so devotions are really kind of translating the faith into more culturally uh, accessible uh, terms. And so, uh, so they can be very beautiful, but, but we need to engage them in the same way. We need to let them open up vulnerability with us, not just become a thing that I do to get it done, yeah. but rather become a, a, a mode of relationship. But, but I mean, there is, I know exactly what you're saying, I think, but there is something to just 
having something that you get done. Um, like you go on a date night and you may not, ha- and the relationship may not be banging on all cylinders. You may not have any kind of vulnerable moments, but you're committed to it because you know that if you weren't committed to it, you wouldn't end up having those vulnerable moments. I, I, one of the things I like about praying the rosary daily and committing to that is sometimes it is just like, I'm going to get it done. And it's That's not, right. it's not, I mean, I, I would want to have the idea of, okay, I want to, I want to enter into the mysteries and like come before our lady. That would want to be the intentionality, right. but just like the date night, you don't go yes. on the date night just to get it done. That's exact. Yeah, that, that's right. Yeah, you wouldn't go on the date night to get it done, but you would recognize committing to it, even though you might foresee that it won't be that enjoyable because you've got to get back early or because you're not feeling terribly well or, you know, but, but you, you get you it open done. open to the moment. You are, right? yeah. You, you, you know, yeah. I mean, there's a, it only takes a moment really to have a, <laughs> that's right. a lightning of grace in a relationship or in prayer. So we're, so we're open to that while recognizing you don't ever get there. That's where I think the, the, the problem falls on the other end is like, well, so you're not gonna have anything structured? How's that gonna work? Uh, but this is, I like to think of this in terms of the body, right? The skeleton and the musculature. Mm. We don't like to hug a skeleton, but we don't like to hug a blob of muscle either. You really, you really need both of those things together. You need some structure, but then you wanna put some flesh on it. and. And that's going to be more or less at any given time. So we need and, to and keep f- up the structure. And flesh that out for me. Yeah. Uh, skeleton. <laughs> and what is the skeleton and the flesh in this analogy? Well, so the devotional, you know, that I have the structure, whether the liturgy or the rosary or the, uh, you know, my divine mercy chaplet or my litany of trust I saw you had out there. It's beautiful. Yeah, it is beautiful. Uh, we have these different, you know, to or the date night. So there's a structured, yeah. hard, yes, fixed... I see. But then allowing it to kind of come alive in this ah, moment, this good. time, to speak to me here, to become a vehicle by which I can give myself as much as possible with, while knowing sometimes it's there and sometimes it's not. And, and the thing is, a real relationship is an encounter of two freedoms, right? Mm. So if it were always up to me, then it, it wouldn't be two freedoms. Now, my side, my freedom is up to me, so I have to bring myself but I can't determine what the other end of the relationship is going to do at any given time. And that's where I have to let God be free to, you know, just have the date night that's checking a box this time. Mm. But if I didn't have that date night, I wouldn't have the other date night where all the lights went on. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. I, I, I'll keep saying this quotation. I still don't know who said it, but I think there's marvelous wisdom in it. If you know, you tell me. There are many devotions within the church's treasury. Choose only a few and be faithful to them. I think it's Francis de Sales. Really? Cool. That's uh, that's who I've always referred back to. You've heard that, that quote? Uh, I don't know anybody not, who's heard not that word quote. For, I'm trying to figure out. Not word for word, but the, the idea of uh, kind of the devotions you start with. Pick a few, and, and yeah. those are the devotions that you stick with. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think there's real wisdom yeah. in that. Well, the Benedictines, we, uh, we don't make the vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience. I make neither a vow of poverty nor chastity. How about that? That's amazing. <laughs> so you just obedience. Obedience, <laughs> stability, and then conversion of life according to the monastic rule. So that's where poverty and chastity get worked <laughs> they in. They slip it in although, there. Uh, like, although our, I didn't our know idea, I was making a commitment to that. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> our idea of poverty is not Franciscan poverty, mm-hmm. as evidenced by luxurious Benedictine monasteries. It's oh. a communal poverty, communal yeah. ownership. But in any event, uh, we make a vow of stability. That's one of the unique benedictine vows and i think there's a real you know that's that's where the danger of just floating from one devotion to the next mm. because why are you moving on to get a thing yes. you know this is like a, you gotta pick rush you gotta dopamine pick dopamine hit yeah yeah right you gotta pick one woman you know mm. yeah the the date night whatever she's gonna have her imperfections but eventually if you're gonna get married you gotta stick with one yes. if you're gonna keep uh having first dates then it's not gonna go anywhere that's and really good yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, speaking of the, this vow of stability, it seems to me that we live in this kind of increasingly sort of fluid culture where people are just getting up and leaving, say to Steubenville, who knows, um, like that, <laughs> uh, or choosing to kind of live in RVs and just be nomads. And I, I get the appeal to that, absolutely. But maybe in your own experience, why, why, has, why is it maybe an important thing to consider staying where you are sort of geographically you yeah know? because that's that's the decision my wife and i have come to that's a difficult one in february in steubenville but <laughs> in a uh, pandemic in a pandemic <laughs> but like we're just like all right we're committed let's let's stay here let's stay here now you know we've moved a yeah. lot you know 
it's beautiful. I, uh, as as Benedictines, we we sanctify a place, and and I and I hope you can come visit us at Saint Vincent. There's everybody that comes says it's so peaceful here. Well, yeah, there are 650 monks buried up on the hill, right? And they gave their whole lives to sanctifying this place. We've been praying the divine office chanting the psalms for 175 years in this place and and places absorb that so i i don't know where we've lost that sense in our our modern culture science has not allowed us to have the idea that that prayer can affect matter or something i don't know where Mm -hmm. where that comes from but but there's something beautiful about sanctifying a place and on the one hand it can be uh painful sometimes we have painful memories that that uh, get stuck in a place and there become some triggers that, uh, but sometimes it's important to have those to run into so that we can actually work through them. We can't just leave all of our skeletons behind. We can't just leave all of the wounds behind. And certainly the beautiful moments, they pile up. And I think we experience that in family homes that have been around. Now, again, sometimes there are you know, demons there, maybe literally or at least figuratively from from bad experiences. But the beautiful experiences that develop over generations in the family home. I remember my, uh, so I was a Navy brat. We moved around growing up, uh, but my, we, we spent a lot of time visiting my father's uh, family home on a farm outside of uh, Penn State. And uh, that, that home, I can still feel it right now. Yeah, there's, a, there's a quality to it of, of things that build up and, uh, so I, I don't know. I think there's a. I think we've lost a sense of that. We tend to make everything short term. We don't mm-hmm. keep things very long. We're ready to replace it with the next generation. And uh, mm-hmm. I, I love this. You know, there's something about this studio and maybe this uh, wood and some other things here that have a kind of uh, gravitas. gravitas. Yeah. yeah, exactly. There's a. I wanted. I wanted it to feel like the nook of an Irish pub, as it were. Just nice some place to sit and chat. Yeah. Yeah, an Irish pub that's been there for more than a year and a half. Yeah. Right, that's exactly. uh, had a lot of people, a lot it's, of it life still has hasn't passed through there. Television. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's there. right. Yeah, yeah exactly. Oh, that's great. So, but it's a there's a commitment there and a risk there in in putting down roots and deciding. Well, uh, for better for worse, right? I mean, it's a uh, not unrelated to the commitment of marriage, and yeah. uh, we can't just keep moving on. And and everything's going to be limited, but. Uh, there's a there's a depth that can develop. There's that saying, "Wherever you go, there you are." Yes, and that's just bloody spot on, isn't it? Yeah, we can keep we, starting over, but we're still we going to be running into ourselves. That's right. Um, the Benedict Medal. Mm-hmm. Are you familiar with, uh, <laughs> with this? You've heard of the Saint Benedict Medal. Blessed a few, you? yeah. Tell tell us about it. Well, it's uh. If I'm not mistaken, so this is actually the front of the medal, okay. the, the, the insignia, the CSPB, mm-hmm. Crux Sancti Patris Benedicti, the cross of Holy Father Benedict. And uh, it goes back to the, I, I mentioned that Benedict was uh, nearly killed twice by, uh, by his would-be murderers. Uh, one of the ways that he found that out was by making the sign of the cross over the <laughs> goblet, which then cracked and he saw an image of a snake and realized it was poisoned. And then uh, he made the sign of the cross in different situations that brought healings, that exposed evil. And, and so the cross of Holy Father Benedict is, uh, has a power against evil and a power to bless. In fact, that the name itself, Benedict, means blessing, mm-hmm. uh, Benedictus. So, so the, uh, the, the cross is there. And then the, the other letters, may the cross of Christ be my light. May the devil, the dragon, never be my guide is, is on the crossbar itself. And then... Uh, around the edge is is turn back Satan and uh, drink your own poison, mm-hmm. and so these uh, inscribed in the the image itself are exorcistic prayers. Uh, this image was not developed by Saint Benedict, if I'm not mistaken. It actually appeared in the it's the earliest version is found in the uh, the crypt of our mother house in Metten, Germany. Mm-hmm. So. Feel a little personal connection to the yeah. the, the medal of Saint Benedict, mm-hmm. and then this particular version of it with this image, a kind of Boyerinese image of Saint Benedict, was was minted in the the Jubilee in 1880, the 1400th anniversary of Benedict's birth, and the prior who minted this was uh, Boniface Krug, who was one of our monks who joined Monte Cassino. Mm. Another little connection, but the uh, the the blessing over the medal. Also has an exorcism, so the the priest exorcises the metal first, and then uh, pours out the blessing on it. 
that uh, we might also be protected from evil. So, mm. so it's a it's a very popular. Um, See, I, I'm surprised that y'all wouldn't wear one. Just like the Carmelites have their long brown <laughs> scapula, you know, like where. <laughs> well, we we are the Benedict Medal, I suppose. That's a, <laughs> it's uh, fashioned after us. Okay, so, that's fair. Um, but I do carry one. I do have, you? Uh, yeah, yeah, beautiful. I have one on my own rosary. All right, so when we come back uh, from our little break here, we're going to ta- start taking some questions from those in the live chat and on Patreon. So if you have a question for Father Boniface, uh, if you've always wanted to ask a question to a Benedictine monk, and now's your time, so feel, feel free to put them up. All right, cool. All right, thanks for watching. Hope you're enjoying the show. I want to say thank you to our sponsor, Homeschool Connections. <laughs> That's it. It sounded like there was more. Homeschool Connections. If you go to homeschoolconnections.com slash Matt, you'll learn more about this wonderful group. If you want your homeschooler to have an excellent Catholic education where they're not only receiving great education, but they're also having instilled within them a love for learning, you really can't go past homeschoolconnections.com slash Matt. You can have your child take courses in apologetics where they'll have teachers like Trent Horn or Tim Staples. Also an excellent author, Joseph Pierce, who's a a Catholic convert. He teaches English. They've just got a list of amazing professors. So go check them out, homeschoolconnections.com slash Matt. Maybe you just want your kid to take one or two courses to supplement the homeschooling you're you're already offering. Or maybe you want them to just basically use Homeschool Connections to, to, to have all of their education needs met. Wherever you're at, go check them out, homeschoolconnections.com slash Matt. Very affordable, and it's excellent Catholic education. Homeschoolconnections.com slash Matt. Also, I want to say thank you to Hallo. Hallo is an excellent app that will help you to pray and to meditate. There are many apps online that help people meditate, but unfortunately, these are often imbued with New Age practices and ways of thinking. You don't have to be worried about that, though, when you go to Hallo because it's 100% Catholic. And the app is as good as it gets. This is why it is the number one downloaded Catholic app on the iTunes store. They've got all sorts of things. It'll help you pray the rosary, go through the daily readings, a nightly examine. They even have sleep stories from different folks. Uh, It's really great. Now, if you download the app, it has a bunch of free things. But you want to go to the website and sign up. And that way you'll have access for a whole month for free. So go to hallow.com, and there's a link in the description below, slash Matt Frad, um, hallow.com slash Matt Frad. And yeah, that, that, that would be a way for you to sign up and then get access to everything um, all at once for a month. And if you like it, you can keep going. If you don't, you can stop. But my wife and I have used it, and I think you'll really like it. All right, back to my discussion with Father Boniface. All right, so what was funny about that is that was a pre-recorded commercial. So for those of you who are watching, are like, what just happened? Why do they have whiskey bottles on their table all of a sudden? That, that, <laughs> that, that, that's why. All right, so uh, first of all, tell our tell, talk about moderation again, because you know there's going to be some people who are like, why would they drink whiskey? <laughs> well, because it's amazing. That's why we would. <laughs> so we have it's a, like liquid bread. <laughs> whiskey or beer? Well... Whiskey is uh, the same stuff as beer, but just distilled, right? Hmm. All right. Okay, this is Bibb and Tucker. It's pretty good. I like it. It's got a great, it's a great bottle. Hmm. It is a great bottle. Good. So, all right, this has been great. Hey, I wanted to ask you before we get to questions about the uh, Benedict option. Yeah. It seems to me that that's a pretty massively misunderstood book whenever people seem to talk about it and criticize it it sounds like they're saying exactly what rodrea wasn't namely isolate yourselves you know so yeah that's always the first thing that if i say the benedict option people say oh is that really what we need is a ghettoized catholicism yeah Uh, or people who want a ghettoized catholicism who say yeah i really like that book the benedict option because that reaffirms the thing that i already think oh yeah and uh no, I, I thought uh, if I can pitch my third book uh, on, on St. Joseph, Through the Heart of St. Joseph, I, I called the last chapter of it the Joseph Option because I make the proposal that Benedict himself chose the Joseph Option, which is really to form a Nazareth and uh, a place where there is real love, where the presence of God is uh, always appreciated, where there is a, a tender authority that, that mm. rules over the place. But I think... Uh, 
Rodriers, as far as I can tell, the main proposal that uh, you could, you know, accept or reject is the idea that Christians need to give up on reforming Christendom by electing the right guy or by taking over the government or by mm. working at that kind of uh, level. And he encourages people to work on the small scale, to be 11 and to form Christian culture wherever they are. And as far as I can tell, the, the rest of the book is then just descriptions of how that's happening in a lot of different communities. And in education or in media or in uh, just family life in communities or in forming a more liturgical spirituality or I don't remember all the topics off the top of my head, but I think the idea of how do we form Christian culture and uh, do that on a small scale rather than worrying about sort of taking over, you know, St. Patrick uh, evangelized Ireland by converting the king, right? It's a, it's one of the modes. Mm. but. Basically, as I read Rod Dreher, he's saying, we're not going to convert the king. We need to just build up Christianity from the grassroots. Yeah, which is what we're doing here in Steubenville. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Uh, all right, let's take some questions here. Um, Nigel, thanks for being a patron, Nigel. He says, what would you recommend when prayer is dry for an extended period of time? Is it more important to show up and just honor the time? Or should I be doing something different to try to get out of the rut? Well, it's... Uh I can imagine three different scenarios with uh, three different answers to that question. So maybe I'll just uh, throw a few out and he can uh, wear whatever one fits. But uh, certainly persevere. I, I think the very simple guidance of St. Ignatius in his uh, first week rules of discernment that in a time of spiritual desolation, don't change your spiritual plan. So if God wants you to do something different, he'll inspire you to do something different. Don't start shifting everything around to try and uh, catch the, mm. the right wave. Uh, second thing to consider is sometimes prayer is dry because there are things we don't want to bring to prayer. So it's like God is only willing to talk to us about one thing, and we're determined to not show him that part of our life. And, uh, and maybe that's the very fact that prayer is difficult, and I need to express that. Or like we were talking about earlier, just being willing to say, Gosh, I've been at this. I've been a monk for 23 years, and I feel like I don't know how to pray. That's very humbling. And sometimes that's the thing I need to bring up and look at that. Mm. Well, why do I feel like I ought to know how to pray? And is there a dimension of pride there that I need to face? And mm. can I just accept that in the end, I'm a little child, and I'm always going to be one, and I need a father, and I just need to surrender to that? Anyway, sometimes there is a kind of interior thing. And Ignatius says the same thing. Don't change the external, like going mm -hmm. to prayer, change the internal, see if there's something you're not bringing up, or or just try to meditate, praise God in a certain way, some suitable penance, or, uh, you know, one of these ways, uh, or just asking God for help. Lord, I, it's dry, help me. Mm. Um, so I think that's, uh, yeah, certainly, certainly persevere. I mean, uh, and again, you can get into all of the things, but I mean, it could be a, a night of the senses in a, in a deeper way. I like to, as we were talking about the conceptualist versus the experiential language, uh, these these knights of St. John of the Cross have gotten all of this kind of mystical quality to them. Oh, the, oh, the, the magical knights. But in a very basic way, it's running into the limit of ourselves. It's And, and it may be precisely the experience that our Mm. Uh, our questioner is going through is, is sort of hitting the limits of what his own efforts can produce. It's like John of the Cross is the path of nada, right? No say nada. I know nothing. I know nothing. I know nothing. Yeah, ultimately, when we reach the limits of ourselves, we can only transcend those by walking in that disorienting space of not knowing what's going on mm. and walking in the, but the, the silent love of, of his presence. Mm. Um, Matthew Keho, thanks for being a patron. Matthew, he says, in your book on spiritual direction, you make the recommendation of not mentioning idiosyncrasies of the directee because it can cause attraction. The prima facie seems like a natural part of friendship. Would that be wrong? Not sure if this question fits with the interview. <laughs> Did that make sense to you? Uh, I, I know. I know exactly what he's talking okay. about. And uh I think it says to be careful about those things. So a little bit related to what we were talking about earlier, how, you know, kind of the, the lovable qualities in relationship uh, that we, we notice little things, you know, you notice the little things that your wife does and that she herself doesn't realize she does. And, uh, mm. 
And pointing that out and delighting in that is a way that you grow in your love relationship with her. So in spiritual direction, the director may notice those things and, and needs to be a little bit careful. He's not trying to develop a love relationship with his uh, directee. And so that's where just being a little bit careful about that. But sometimes it's uh, possible to point out, you know, that uh, I see your, your foot kind of moving there. Uh, the way, I like the way you, 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 know, you turn in your foot there a little bit. And then suddenly the person becomes aware of themselves and, you know, can melt a little bit and, and there can be a beautiful oh, opening. But anyway, it's, there's some power there. And so one wants to be a little careful about mm. uh, exercising that. That's I the see. point. Um, does, does every Christian need a spiritual director? Are too many Christians seeking out spiritual direction? <laughs> Not enough? What say you? Well, uh, I really like the, uh, you know, again, the, the Orthodox tradition of everybody having a spiritual father and there being a kind of parallel with apostolic succession and spiritual father succession, you know, I think is a, a, a beautiful thing. Um, the, the tradition seems pretty clear that it's a gift. It's not a necessity. It's, a, it's not a right. So there isn't a, you have a right as a Catholic to go to mass. And so that necessitates a priest having an obligation mm -hmm. to say mass and even multiple masses to provide for the rights of the faithful. There isn't a right to a spiritual director. But I think it's a tremendous help. Uh, and, and Pope Francis, well, Pope John Paul and Pope Benedict before him, but Pope Francis has really brought this out. Uh, and has even in, in his exhortation Christus Vivit on the, after the Synod on the Youth, uh, there's a little section that says how important accompaniment is even to the point that perhaps an ecclesial office should be or an ecclesial mm. title should be given to that. And I said, yes. Mm. Uh, so anyway, we have a school of spiritual direction at St. Vincent that I'm uh, in charge of. And uh, forming more spiritual directors is part of what I'm trying to do so that I can maybe get a little bit more sleep at night. Yeah. Is it important that somebody seek out a priest or can somebody who is not a priest be a spiritual director? Yeah, and uh, again, the, the original spiritual directors were the Desert Fathers who were not priests. Uh, so it certainly seems mm. to be a, a charism. Uh, now, often it's a charism associated with the priestly office, and the Congregation for Clergy said that all priests should be offering spiritual direction. So hopefully all the priests who are watching this are paying attention to that. And uh, at the same time, it's a, it's a charism that, and many of the people who come to our school are, are lay people who have a real spiritual life, who themselves are receiving spiritual direction, and their spiritual directors feel like they have uh, a gift to accompany others. Okay. Uh, we have a question here from an atheist, so we've got to read that. Double base. Thanks for being here, mate. He says, I have a question. As an atheist, I am scared of the idea of eternally burning in a lake of fire. Mm, when too. I die here on earth and I have not become convinced that God exists, what will happen to me? <sighs> That's a great question, isn't it? Uh I have, uh, I have a lot of hope in God's mercy. So all we offer in the church is the ordinary means of salvation. So the way that we know is the way of the sacraments, the way of uh, faith in Christ. And so I can only share what I know will lead us to a relationship with him and an eternal happiness. But we have hope for everyone. We have hope in God's mercy that he will take somebody who has really tried. And I, and I think that would be my, you know, just uh, my reflection question for our uh, questioner. You know, are you, are you really trying? Are you really willing to let God into your life? Are, are you able to, to say a prayer? I think um, there's a guy at Penn State who's been preaching in front of the Willard Building for like 30 years. I'm not sure if he is, still is today, but he was as of at least 10 years ago. And uh, I remember walking past there one day when I was considering myself an atheist, and he said, you can't really be an atheist because you can't be certain that there is no God. You have to at least admit the possibility. And so if you're agnostic, then wouldn't you want to find out? And I, and I would say the first way to find out is certainly asking questions like this. I give uh, uh, the viewer credit for that. And then just trying to say a prayer. God, if you exist, I want to know you. Um, I think How's you said it? a prayer like that. Yeah, that was my prayer. Well, you say, Lord, if you exist, show me in a way that I would understand. 
Um, I also think Pascal's wager is often misunderstood for a number of reasons. It's not an argument for God's existence, obviously, uh, nor is it an argument to shut down your intellect and just accept any old thing. But it seems to me that if you have two available, say, live options before you and you can't decide between the two, um, it's not irrational to ask, well, what do I get from accepting or rejecting either mm. of these things? And so, you know, obviously, if you consider the alternatives and atheism makes more sense to you, then it, it might seem uh, rather, what would you say, uh, not hypocritical? That might not be the word, but to, to accept Christianity. But that said, if God doesn't exist, I'm not sure why we should be terribly concerned with being moral or acting morally. Right. Um, but I do think that's a compelling argument that one of the things Pascal says, right, if you've got these two available options before you say they are Catholicism and atheism, and you can't really decide between the two. He says, OK, well, just just bet on God, as it were. And that's rather crass. But uh, God stoops to conquer. And perhaps you can begin there. And then he says to do things that Catholics do. Uh, you say, well, I don't really feel it. Okay, well, do what they do and you will feel it. So begin right. to use holy water. Begin to receive the sacraments if you're baptized, these sorts of things, to pray in these. I think, I think, uh, I think Ratzinger says something similar in Introduction to Christianity. Mm. Basically, this is a meeting point of believers and non-believers is, is on the point of uncertainty. <laughs> so we all, we all have doubt. And, and doubt is a healthy thing because there's room for freedom and so there's room for faith. But he says... Let's act as if God exists. And what does that look like? Mm -hmm. So just very exactly what you're saying. You've said uh, more clearly, but yeah, it's a beautiful uh, invitation. And I, and I think ultimately, I mean, though I, I expressed it poorly, but I think in my, my own journey, I came to a point that I was willing to take a step forward and try it out. And that was the that fundamental step of faith. Okay, I'm, I, I looked at it long enough from the outside. It seems compelling to me. There are good people on the inside. I'm going to... Take a step. Yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, we have a question here from Aaron Miller. Thanks, mate. He says, in adoration, why does exposure of the Eucharist matter? I can't look into his eyes. Hmm. Well, uh, I would say one thing is that exposition of the Blessed Sacrament is a liturgy. So there's, uh, there's something that's active about that. It's my understanding that's why you need somebody there. It's not to protect the Blessed Sacrament. It's not like the 85-year-old lady who's there in the middle of the night is protecting the Blessed Sacrament. Uh. But it's because there's a liturgy that's taking place. And then if you think about that, in some of these adoration chapels, we have these liturgies that have been taking place for months and months. We always repose everything on Good Friday, so we can't say years continuously, but it's like a, a six-month-long or a nine- or 12-month-long liturgy that we can only sustain together. Mm -hmm. So I'm sustaining a liturgy with other people. Something very beautiful about that. So I think that the liturgical dimension of that exposition is one thing. And then I think you can take, you know, there's something about him being exposed. Uh, we use the word, and of mm -hmm. course there's a vulnerability there. Mm -hmm. and, and you're right, of course you can't see his eyes, but you can imagine that he's taken himself a degree out of his, uh, the barrier or out from behind the veil. He has revealed himself, exposed himself in order to come close, closer to us. So. I think all of those dimensions, which are, uh, you know, there's a there's a symbolism in the in the best sense, a signification, a meaning to that that's that's valuable to see the way that God wants to meet us. Mm. Wes says, "Thanks for being a patron." Wes, he says, "Any thoughts on prayer journals? I've never used one, and really thought using it would get in the way, but many swear by them." I think it's very personal. I've never really used one either. I, I take notes in my, I use Verbum for my Bible and yeah. I, I take notes on Verbum when there are things that stand out to me. And, uh, and that's been fun to kind of come run into the scriptures again years later. I, I tend to pray with the gospel of the day. I've been doing that for years. And so running into my own notes, sometimes I'm inspired by my own prayer from five years ago. Uh, so that's its own value. But mm. I know people who do, who, who write, write in prayer journals, and, and you can do that in some different ways. I find some people, who, especially who are very extroverted, need that kind of external processing. They need to be able to express themselves to kind of keep things moving, and, and then it's great. So use a, use a prayer journal. Mm. Um, other people want to kind of gather together the wisdom. Usually if you make a 30-day retreat, your retreat director will actually ask you to keep a prayer journal so you know what to talk about. And, uh, in the spiritual direction meeting, but also because 
you're making four holy hours a day for 30 days. There's a lot of stuff there, much more than you can unpack in 30 days. And then having that prayer journal that you revisit a year later, a year later, a year later, um, can bring you back in touch with, with some of the graces that God has been giving you. Yeah, I need to do that more. One thing I've been doing lately in my kind of prayer experience is I'll send myself an email <laughs> and I'll star <laughs> nice. the email so nice. I can go back to it and pray with it because, you know, our Lord can can encounter us in some powerful ways and reveal some truths to us that he wants for our own edification, but we tend to forget these things, and so it can be helpful for sure. Mm. What do you think of that whiskey? It's not great. I don't know. It's, it's been watered, watered down. down. Yeah. Someone may have put water in it. <laughs> Drink that, and then we'll try that one over there. <laughs> I, don't, I apologize for that. I don't know what this is. Old fa- See, this is like an old-fashioned mix. Sorry, I, I should have. I didn't know you would drink with me, so I didn't. Uh, <laughs> I didn't think to get the good. I stuff. learned to appreciate single malts when I was studying in Germany. I had a good uh, German friend that I met there who uh, had a love for single malts and gave me a taste for him. Can I share with you a toast that I recently heard? Love it. All right. To the years spent in a, in the arms of another man's wife, <laughs> my mother. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes, my mother, right? Yes. Nice. Good. Beautiful. Someone did that recently. I'm like, oh, dude, no. I'm like, ah, I get you. <laughs> it's better. A bit too sweet because it's a mix, but it's at least not watered down. Better. <laughs> um, what do you think? Uh, or what, tell me why, uh, you know, beer has been such a big thing in sort of monasticism. What, why did... Uh, <clears throat> it seems like there's a lot of, uh, you know, monasteries that produce ale... I, I should have a better answer for that. The, the things that I've heard are uh, obviously keeping things that, you know, in general, when you keep things through the winter, you need things that ferment, that, yeah. that have already gone bad, so they're not going to go bad. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so you control how they go bad. And I, and I think that a lot of things, you know, like sauerkraut or, or a blue cheese or, you know, there are different fermented things that have developed. Uh, so... I think with the grain harvest, uh, one of the ways that you preserve the grain and its nutrients and yeah. some other things is by sort of letting it go bad in a controlled way. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, uh, you know, and it's a tasty beverage, and I'm sure that uh, as Scripture has, uh, uh, what is that, Psalm 4, uh, you have given us a greater joy than they have from uh, corn and new wine, yeah. but the corn is really, you know, beer, beer and wine. Uh, so, so it brings us a joy. And the scripture is acknowledging that. But of course, the Lord is a greater joy. So mm. we, we wouldn't understand what the Lord's wine cellar meant if we didn't have actual wine cellars and what they meant. Amen. You know? So uh, there's, a, there's a good and you know, God is always better. It's sort of like where St. Paul says, like physical uh, exercise is to some avail, you know, right, to something right. to that effect. So he is acknowledging that there is a good to sort of physical working out. Right. We had a question here from Ellen. Thank you for, for being here. Question, she says... I am not Catholic, but something is compelling me towards it. I am a Protestant Christian. I am a member of a church I love. What steps do you recommend? Um, There's a... Well, I guess... It's it's hard to say without knowing exactly what's what's compelling and uh, what the connections are, but... Because it's not, you know, Catholicism isn't an idea, right? It's a, it's a living body. And so getting to know Catholics is, is important. Obviously, the liturgy is the source center and summit of the faith. So ultimately, there needs to be something brought into the liturgy, although uh, probably if she's a Protestant Christian, she can appreciate worship and then, um, you know, maybe can come into the Mass. But then it's hard to just come into the Mass or the Divine Liturgy if you don't know what's going on. Mm. And so... I guess I, it would be important to have a little bit more context. more context, yeah, of what, what steps to take. But certainly, if there's a Catholic in her life that she knows, uh, what is it that's compelling exactly? And then probably that's a direction to press into. You know, maybe it's the Matt Frad show, uh, mm-hmm. Pints with Aquinas. And so watch more of that and pick up more of the wisdom and then maybe try to tease out what it is that's, that's compelling or what's not there in the, in the Protestant church. I would also say, too, to maybe check out um, Father Mike Schmitz on Ascension Presents. If you're mm-hmm. not familiar with that Catholic YouTube channel, type in Ascension Presents. Maybe look up some Father Mike Schmitz videos. It's kind of a nice kind of slow way to get introduced to the faith. You don't have to feel put on the spot or cornered or anything. You can just, yeah, one of the nice things about YouTube, I suppose. Mm-hmm. Uh, Father Matthew uh, Marinelli says, good <laughs> to see if you know who that is, do you? I do. Good to see Father Boniface. He has helped many seminarians and priests to know the Father's love. God bless. Isn't that lovely? 
He's a newly ordained priest in the Diocese of Metuchen in New Jersey and a marvelous person. Hmm. Good. Yeah. I look forward to meeting him one day. Um, Sean says, uh, why doesn't the church promote meditation? I find it brings me closer to God and my Lord, Yeshua. Since starting it 11 years ago, I've had many mystical experiences. So does the church promote meditation? Does she not? <laughs> well, why, one why of the not? problems with these words, uh, meditation <laughs> and contemplation get, uh, get used to mean so many different things. Mm. Uh, I'm, I'm guessing if it's something the church is not promoting that he might be thinking about something like transcendental meditation, which would be derived from uh, Buddhist, uh, Eastern spiritualities, which would be using a, a, a mantra or trying to empty the mind. Um, so sometimes it's been called mindfulness or it's been brought in. Centering prayer was a way of sort of bringing that into Catholic circles. I, I would say that that kind of, you know, the, the reality is we live in a very noisy world, right? So, and we're, we're always multitasking. We've got 15 different things showing up on our phone and, and coming in from every angle. And so our minds tend to be like those snow globes, mm. you know, that you shake up and it's got the things all, and, and, and there's no way to like force all that stuff to the bottom, which is kind of what needs to happen so that we make some room for God as we enter into, because prayer does slow things down. God tends to communicate a little different speed than the way that we're running our lives normally. And so there is a place for letting that stuff, the, the snow settle as it were. And can we, can we help that to happen? Well, sure. I, and I think, you know, the, the Jesus prayer is, is one way that the, the Christian church has, has developed to just have a, a a, a slowly repeated word that's focusing us on Christ. It's helping some of that stuff to settle. I think the problems have come in when we've said, oh, that's prayer. No, no, that's an ascetical preparation for prayer. That's a, that's a, a psychological exercise that prepares us for going deeper in prayer. And it's a way of setting other things aside in order to make room for God. And, and so it can be a nice preparation. Transcendental meditation, as such, could be opening us to all kinds of things. That's where, as we're doing that kind of ascetical preparation, we need to be focusing our attention on the living God who has come to us not as uh, a nothingness, but has come to us in a person uh, who became flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus Christ has a face and a voice, and so uh, trying to disembody our prayer is not the goal. Uh, we are embodied, he is embodied, and our, our prayer you know, develop, in, includes our humanity. So there's a way that transcendental meditation can also kind of try to remove our humanity. So anyway, to tease out, I'm not claiming that the, uh, the, the questioner is, uh, is doing anything in particular, and I'm not trying to uh, condemn or, or uh, endorse whatever he's doing. But mm -hmm. as far as I understand the question, yeah. the transcendental meditation gets... We have to be uh, careful about how, how that really is coming into the faith and whether that's really opening us to a relationship. That's the other thing is some of these things, you know, and uh, I mean, people talk about mystical experiences, but it, it really has nothing to do with relationship. It's about using a technique to generate a psychological experience. That's also not prayer. So that can be a preparation for prayer. Sometimes the experience of closing the doors and, and turning off the lights and being in silence makes us feel so good because we're so assaulted by so many other things that having a little bit of natural peace feels really good. That's not prayer, that's natural peace. Then that becomes prayer as it becomes relational and we start to connect with the Lord which can happen also with distracted thoughts and hot rooms and vacuum cleaners and, and a lot of other things. So mm. uh, we don't require external circumstances or even internal psychological states to have a relationship with God. How many hours do y'all pray a day, technically, like when you're in the monastery? Um, I'd say liturgically two and a half to three hours and then... Uh, usually a, a holy hour individually, and then maybe some other devotional prayers. Uh, sometimes the, liter the, the rosary gets worked into the holy hour or happens somewhere else for some other devotional prayers. But I'd say something like three and a half, four hours a day. And how have you as a community had to be vigilant, say, against the onslaught of technology? I, 
one of the things I love about the friars of the renewal is they refuse to have the internet in their friaries, which I think is marvelous. Uh, I don't know if that's the case with y'all. So how 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 has that been an issue? Surely you've seen it. As monks well, who are meant to be devoting yourself to prayer. And then how have you begun to push back against that or do you still need to? Yeah. Um, we uh, So we run a college and a seminary and there are a lot of things that we use computers for and the internet and... and uh, but we have, in fact, we just had the discussion pretty recently in the community about having the internet in the monastery. So the monastery building is its own thing. And uh, we have a, so in the old days they had a scriptorium. We have sort of an electronic scriptorium, a place where there's uh, Wi-Fi and a couple of computers. And it's in a, it's in a public space. And, and so it actually has gathered community. We just introduced that, I don't know, maybe, maybe 10 years ago, maybe not even. And that's actually gathered community in a nice way. And so, you know, uh, seminarians can go there and work on their, their studies. Other people can go use the, the computers there. But we just, uh, there was just a push to spread the Wi-Fi throughout the monastery, mm -hmm. uh, which was resisted. Good. Yeah. Uh, so we recognize, you know, there are a couple of old monks who that's their only, they can't make their way over to the college for uh. other purposes. So. We, had, we, we put in a, a mobile hotspot in one place uh, just to make accessible to some that you know, can't move quite as far. But we, but we resisted. I'm, yeah, I'm really happy about that. Mm. Reactionary Opinions says, as a former Protestant, although I'm not sure if you were, although you had that experience with the Bible study, what is Father Boniface's thoughts on the reformation of the church and how we should go about accommodating our brothers and sisters in Christ? Um, wow. Uh, well, you, you're right. I was never uh, formally a part of any any Protestant denomination, although I certainly had that experience. And uh, I certainly would say, as you uh, beautifully said, Matt, you know, thanks to our Protestant brothers and sisters for their evangelical zeal, for their willingness to, to reach out and, and many things that we can learn from them about making a personal profession of faith and doing personal evangelization. Uh, in terms of accommodating Protestants, you know, one thing I think about is, uh, and it's it's come out interestingly in the in the pandemic and the sudden spread to mass online everywhere. But Pope Benedict asked the question, uh, looking at the the courtyard of the Gentiles. So in the in the Jewish temple, there's the holy of holies, there's the sanctuary for the priests, there's the courtyard of the men, the courtyard of the women, and then a courtyard of the Gentiles. And that's where Jesus drove out the money changers. Pope Benedict interprets that prophetically as saying that's because God was now uh, fulfilling the temple and he's making room in his own heart for the Gentiles. And so we have to clear out because really the Gentiles never use the courtyard of the Gentiles. And that's why the, the, the money changers and the you know, people selling everything moved in there. But Pope Benedict asked the question, well, where is the courtyard of the Gentiles today? Where is the place that non-believers or non-Catholics can come close to the worship? If I can, one interpretation for the, from the question is, you know, it is awkward when we bring Protestants to Mass. We, often, we, we do everything at Mass. And so we automatically bring people to Mass, but it's not actually for non-believers or for non-Catholics, for those not in communion. The Mass of the Catechumens, the first part, the Liturgy of the Word, could be used that way. We have the dismissal at RCIA, but Mass is not really the place. So where's a place that people can come close to pray with us, to worship with us? And that's where I think things like festivals of praise, Eucharistic adoration, but now some of the online things have made it possible because uh, the other thing that happens, you bring a, a Protestant to Mass and you got to, you know, stop them from receiving communion and then they feel excluded. They feel like they don't fit in. They don't know when to sit or stand or what to say and it feels very awkward and then sometimes they go away feeling worse than when they came. So that's not helpful. But that's not a sign that we should change the Mass. That's a sign that we should find a courtyard of the Gentiles. And uh, one of the things that came out of that proposal of Pope Benedict was uh, the Pontifical Council for Culture created a courtyard of the Gentiles. So they had a gathering outside of Notre Dame Cathedral of happy memory, hopefully a future uh, glory in Paris, where they had artists and poets and philosophers and uh, musicians, and they gathered together for a sharing of these cultural goods. And 
Then, of course, Notre Dame Cathedral is there, and there were things going on inside. And so if people wanted to go in and begin to experience some of the mystery, they could do that. But um, I think some of those sort of shallow entry points, I, I think we sort of fail a little bit like we were saying earlier with, you know, not really helping people to fall in love mm. with their faith, with the Lord in prayer. I think those are the spaces that I, I see a need to, to really develop. Kyle Myers says, why do you think St. Benedict had such a negative view of laughter? Is that true? <laughs> and why did you just well, laugh about that? <laughs> <laughs> there's, a, there's a comment in, uh, I guess it's the, the chapter on humility. I'm, I'm going to guess that he watched The Name of the Rose and uh, saw the... Uh, creative development of this idea of the suppression of laughter from that uh, that movie or that book. But there's a, there are a couple of comments about monks not laughing boisterously, as I was just doing. <laughs> and uh, at the same time, there's... So that... Uh, St. Benedict was writing that in the context of the Goths and the Visigoths, uh, mm -hmm. in in which that laughter comes forth from a kind of dominant pride. There's a there's a there's a dominating kind of laughter that can be almost sinister in its uh, in its uncouth and uh, sort of bold. It's the it's the laughter of victors who are who are lording it over their enemies. Mm -hmm. You know. Uh, I think that's the laughter that St. Benedict is referring to because the rule itself is hilarious in some points. St. Benedict's own sense of humor, as I described earlier, you know, we hear that monks should not drink wine. Since the monks of our day cannot be convinced of this, I mean, there are several places in the rule. How can you read these things and not laugh? So there's certainly a joyfulness and a lightheartedness, but it's, I think, that kind of dominant, um, more prideful laughter that he's speaking against in those sections on humility. Yeah, in the Summa Theologiae, when Aquinas talks about the virtue of playfulness, he Eutropelia. uses a, What's that? Eutropelia. Yes, he uses a Greek word, um, which is the sort of mean between the extremes of buffoonery and boorishness. There you go, yeah. So maybe that we could also think of that sort of buffoonery, um, that sort of inappropriate laughter. I remember my dad, sometimes my brother and I would get into laughing fits, and he'd say, nothing's that bloody funny. Cut it out. <laughs> <laughs> Which is pretty funny. <laughs> yeah, but that is interesting. And yeah, Aquinas even says that like it's a sin to be a bore. Yeah, you, that's you, right. Your, your presence ought to be. He identifies that we're more likely to fall on the side of, uh, of buffoonery than boorishness. Mm. Uh, most of us need to pull ourselves back more than we need to uh, push ourselves forward. Mm. But... Uh, certainly there are some people that you would put in that category. He uses the, the image there of John the Evangelist uh, That's right. with a, pulling the bow. That's right. Why don't you share that so people know where you're going with that? So uh, John the Evangelist was, was asked about the joy and love that he was having with his disciples. And he asked the, uh, the interlocutor to take a bow and shoot it, shoot an arrow and another one and another one. And he said, can you do that indefinitely? No, the bow would break. And he said, exactly. And so in a similar way, we have to relax the bow. Mm. Even praying all the time, that's what right. I was describing earlier of spending days in prayer, uh, even that's an extraordinary experience. That's not the ideal, but that was important at that time to kind of break through some of my own uh, limitations, my pride and vanity. But that's not the ideal to, unless we're called to it. You know, there are, there are some really extraordinary vocations in the church that are called to more extended times of prayer like that. Yeah, well, I'm thinking of the Summa Theologiae where Aquinas actually dresses, addresses the question of prayer. And one of the questions he asks is, can we pray at all times? And he says both yes and no. Uh, let me see if I can find it here because it does get to what you're talking about there. Let's see here. Yeah, meditation creates a kind of mental exhaustion. It's one of the reasons that prayer can be a penance because there's an effort that's exerted. Should prayer last a long time? Let's check that out. <laughs> um, and so let's see here. Waiting for this to load. The said contra is, it would seem that we ought to pray continually. For our Lord said in Luke 18.1, we ought always to pray and not to faint. And it's written in 1 Thessalonians 5.17, pray without ceasing. The uh, response is, we may speak about prayer in two ways. First, by considering it 
in itself, secondly, by considering in its causes. The cause of prayer is the desire of charity from which prayer ought to arise, and this desire ought to be in us continually, either actually or virtually. For the virtue of this desire remains in whatever we do out of charity, and we ought to do all things for the glory of God. From this point of view, and I love what he's about to say here from Augustine. This point of view, prayer ought to be continual. This is why Augustine says, faith, hope, and charity are by themselves a prayer of continual longing. Mm. So I, I like that. Yeah. But prayer considered in itself cannot be continual. I love how practical he is at this point. Because we have to be busy about other works. <laughs> <laughs> and as Augustine says, we pray to God with our lips at certain in intervals and seasons in order to admonish ourselves by means of such like signs to take note of the amount of our progress in that desire and to arouse ourselves more eagerly to an increase thereof. And he goes on. But it, yeah, it's, I love the practicality of that. Like we, we pray at all times by desire and growing in charity, but like we have stuff to do too. Yeah, the Catechism talks about uh, vocal prayer, meditation, and contemplation. And it describes, this is the way it describes contemplation as that prayer that can be happening at all times. So that's that yeah. longing in faith, hope, and love. That's the, the prayer. You and I are focusing our attention on each other and the things that we're talking about and we're accessing you know, our memories and, and trying to engage in conversation. And so our minds are not sort of focused explicitly on the Lord, but hopefully I, I think we're in this conversation because of a longing of faith, hope, and love to be more united with him. And yes. so we're carrying that loving awareness of his presence with us. And uh, it's one of the ways I like to look at St. Joseph too, and that yeah. sense of Nazareth. And, uh, and it's one of the keynotes of the rule of St. Benedict. He says, the divine presence is always with us. And really you can see the whole rule as arranging the life of the monk to be aware of the divine presence in everything that he's doing. And it's that loving awareness that we can carry around with us at all times. This book on St. Joseph, was that also published with St. Paul? It Santa? is, yeah. The Emmaus Road? That's right, Good yeah. Good stuff. Good stuff. Uh, I, had, I have to throw this next bit out that Aquinas says because we've got an Eastern Christian in the studio today. <laughs> he says, um, It is said that the brethren in Egypt make frequent but very short prayers, rapid ejaculations, as it were, lest the, meaning something very different, of course, <laughs> lest that vigilant and erect, oh, come on, Aquinas, not, <laughs> not ejaculations and erect in the same sentence, lest that vigilant and erect attention, which is so necessary in prayer, slacken and languish through the strain of being <laughs> prolonged. By so doing, they make it sufficiently clear not only that this attention must not be forced, if we are unable to keep it up, oh, listen to that. Yeah. Listen to that. Let's say that again. Um, that this attention in prayer must not be forced if we are unable to keep it up, but also that if we are able to continue, it should not be broken off too soon. Speak to that for a moment. Wow, that's, that's beautiful. Cool, huh? Yeah. So you've heard that saying, somebody says like, you know, the mind can only take what the butt can handle. You know, right, so if you're right. sitting down for too long, at, yeah. at some point you just can't handle it anymore. Yeah. Prayer is kind of like that as well. Yeah. Yeah. The mind can only take what the mind can take also. Hmm. And, uh, and sustaining point, yeah. our attention. I saw this, uh, there's an interview with uh, with Jordan Peterson and Jonathan Pedro. Yeah. And, uh, and Jonathan Pedro described liturgy as paying attention to the highest ideal. And I think there's something really beautiful about that. So sustaining our attention. Mm. And how do we sustain our attention in a certain way in our personal prayer, in a certain way in liturgical prayer, through, uh, through scriptures, different aspects of God, our songs in community, our, you know, th through all of these different venues. But, but paying attention to the highest ideal because we, we become that which we pay attention to. Mm. And we're, we're formed more and more into him. So, so on the one hand... Uh, sometimes people will say, oh, I'm always struggling with distractions. Well, yeah, you know, our minds don't like to focus. We, we tend to, to flit around and we need to be patient with ourselves, but gently renewing attention and finding ways to renew attention. It's one of the fun things in liturgy. Well, so I find myself wandering, you know, halfway through the second reading. I have two choices. I can either start wondering why I'm wandering yes. and how I got here and then get upset at myself that I'm always wandering. Why am I always wandering? And I can't ever do this right. And now yeah. I've become distracted by my distractions. Or in the middle of the second reading, I can just begin listening to whatever word is happening now and let that take me mm. back to attention and, and renew my attention. Yeah, something I try to do when I find my, my mind wandering in prayer is just to pray over that thing. 
Yeah. So whatever it is, right. maybe I'm daydreaming. Here's what I'm going to be doing tomorrow, or here's what I regret, or here's why I feel stupid. That can be a nice way, to, as soon as you recognize that, to bring that to yeah. prayer, as opposed to shoving it aside. And and you've done that in our conversation too. I've appreciated I, that at, di- at different times. You might uh, well when when we came back on, you kind of laughed, and then you explained why you were laughing. Right? It's this you're, uh, you're bringing the internal, this distraction, this thought, whatever it is that you know it came across your face, it came in, yeah. and you brought it into the relationship ah, with me and and with our listeners. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting. Father B. How do we, how do we as lifelong Christians avoid purgatory totally? <laughs> Thank you and God bless. Keep right. going. <laughs> <laughs> Aim for the heights. Where's mm-hmm. Olauto? Justine says, any tips on how to overcome those sticking venial sins we keep doing over and over? Well, you know, I think relationship with both of these things, it's so helpful, right? I mean, how do you... How does your relationship turn into one of those really beautiful marriages? Keep going, you know, as long as there's, as long as there's progress. Uh, the old dictum is, if you're not moving forward, you're falling backward. There's no such thing as staying mm. the same. And so we keep making progress as we, as we bring our venial sins. Sometimes it's really necessary to realize we can't overcome our venial sins. We have to reach the end of our own efforts. And finally, before the Lord, with, with open hands and, and, and poor sad eyes, say, <laughs> please, Lord, you can do this. But... Uh, Anyway, the different things work in different ways. Sometimes the Lord wants to direct us to a new way, a different, a more effort. Sometimes we have to surrender and kind of hand it over to him. Mm. All right. Well, let's see. I think we're kind of running out of questions here. <laughs> this guy says, the Aquinas quote uh, uh, your re- and your reaction have to be a new clip for the show. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that reminds me actually of a time because you know I give I give a lot of talks on pornography. I don't know if you know this or not. That's kind of one of the things I'm sort of known for if I'm known for anything. And I was at this uh, talk on prayer once, and I knew the lady giving the talk, and she was going for that word, you know, like the ejaculatory prayers, where you say something like a quick burst of yeah, you know, a, Jesus. Yakulo is a dart. Okay, so it's a dart outward. There you go. Right. Yeah. So she's like, "What's that word?" And I said, "Ejaculations." And she went, "No." <laughs> oh, yeah. No, you're right. And she said, "If anybody else had have said that, she would have accepted it because I said it." That's funny. I was thinking, I I know you had a conversation with Christopher West recently. He would have had a field day with the middle of that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, he would have. Uh, let's see here. Book recommendations. Catholic Conversation asks book book recommendations. What are you reading right now? Wow, I. Uh Right now, I was uh, I was listening to the audiobook the Tr- the rise and triumph of the modern self by Carl Truman, which is a fascinating study of how we got to this place of politicized sexuality and uh, sort of our, our our sexuality defining who we are and uh, a lot of lot of interesting things to see where things are which seem to be so totally crazy and out of control how we got here. Um, but uh, also I. I tend to read in uh, bits and pieces. I'm not. I'm not good at sustaining uh, individual books, mm. but uh, certainly I've read a lot of books on on Saint Joseph in in preparation for publishing my own book. And I'm always interested in gathering up some bits and pieces, uh, like some of the things that Father Calloway has to say there. Um, trying to think of uh, what's something you, know. you read for fun that wouldn't impress anybody. Mine is. <laughs> <laughs> superhero comics and then like I'm trying to get into Tintin you know the comic Tintin no, no? well don't worry about it <laughs> is there something you like to read or do for fun that... oh gosh you know I uh, I like take classes for fun and yeah. stuff okay. <laughs> cool. All right. I love uh, I love to learn t- I'm I'm, uh, I'm getting an STL from Sacred Heart Seminary which I just added to everything else I get so excited about learning more stuff that I just sleep less and learn more. I, yeah. So uh, I just read, uh, for class, I, I read Father Ronald Knox's The Hidden Stream, which is a kind of um, comprehensive apologetics mm. description of the Christian faith. That might be something for our, our, uh, our viewer who is asking about taking steps toward Catholicism. It's, mm. a, it's a beautiful presentation. Emily Barrows wants to know, do people really hear God's voice? 
Some people are adamant they can actually hear God say things to them. I assume that this is a real grace from the Holy Spirit that maybe I've not yet received. I really, uh, I describe my own experience of uh, recognizing God's voice, that still small voice in the heart, and, and then I had to go through a whole period of trying to figure out, well, okay, when is that him, and when is that me, and what is that like? And I really found so much light in the descriptions of spiritual consolation that St. Ignatius gives. He, he identifies that when we receive an actual grace, it, it overflows into our bodies. And so we experience that as being lifted up above all things so that we are beholding the Creator before every creature. Uh, sometimes we experience it as spiritual joy, sometimes as tears of repentance or of love for God, sometimes as an increase of faith, hope, or love. I like to describe that as like, we know that the Blessed Sacrament is truly the body and blood of Jesus Christ, mm -hmm. but sometimes we look at him and we go, oh my God, it's really you. <laughs> so those moments, you know, spiritual mm -hmm. consolation, or we face really terrible things and we have this real conviction everything is going to work out and we know it's more than just ourselves you know so this is like an increase of faith or hope or certainly of love for god and then the one that people tend to identify the most is that peace and inner stillness and sometimes people say oh follow the peace but there's a point to that so so ignatius is acknowledging that actual grace resonates in our bodies in different ways and then he says, the words that come, the thoughts that come in spiritual consolation are from the Lord. And so that's how I tie those things together. So do we hear God with our ears? Well, not normally. I mean, some people do. That's called an exterior locution. And John of the Cross's wisdom that that shouldn't be trusted is good wisdom. Uh, now, it, in, in very unusual circumstances, God really does communicate that way. And we have visions at uh, Fatima or at Lourdes or, you know, the, the church discerns some of these things. But normally we hear God in those experiences of spiritual consolation. Mm. The lights go on for a moment. The thoughts that come are, are really from him, but they're expressed in our language. You know, does God speak English or does he speak Latin or does he mm -hmm. speak Greek? Well, he speaks in the image and the, and the, the idioms of the person that he's speaking to. Can I give to. you an example of this? I was discerning marrying my wife and I was in prayer one day wondering if I should propose. And it was as if the Lord, I was asking the Lord, give me a sign. Like just, I just want this. And I sensed the Lord say to me, listen, you're old enough and ugly enough to figure this out. What do you want to do? <laughs> I want to marry her. Well, bloody do that. I'm pretty sure. You know, I don't know if that great. was the Lord or not, but that That's was the great. conversation I had. So That's beautiful. It was sort of like sound like my dad. <laughs> <laughs> so I did. I think it was the yeah. next night I proposed to her. Thrilled that I did. Wow. But well, it went with a conviction, didn't it? Yeah, absolutely. You know, there's a there's an increase in faith. There's sometimes it's uh he, when he describes it as that inner stillness. I really identify that. It's like it's like the kinds of the constant buzz that's going on just stills, mm -hmm. and then that voice that comes through, whether, whether it sounds like your dad <laughs> or whether it sounds like whatever uh, rapping that's in in our minds, when that comes through, follow that one. Mm. Um. Marie asks, any advice for young Catholics? Many people belittle me because I am young. Oh, there were young saints at uh, Blessed Carlos Acutis that was uh, just beatified, canonized. Anyway, he was, what, 13 or something? Blessed Ho Saint Jose Sanchez, who's uh, in that For Greater Glory movie, mm -hmm. uh, 12 years old, 11 years old. So, yeah, beautiful to be young and, and faithful and filled with the Holy Spirit. I have some directees who like felt that call at, at an early age to, to marry Jesus. How beautiful to preserve that innocent faith. And then as it matures, you know, a person in their 30s who certainly has a very mature faith, but, but it started at such an innocent, it's so unsullied. You know, God does that with some people. So uh, if you're one of those people, be that. Go go with that. And Rosary Crusader just shared this verse that many of us may have been thinking about from 1 Timothy 4, 12. Let no man despise mm, thy beautiful. youth, Amen. but be thou an example of the of the believers in word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, in purity. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah, certainly central to our faith is the courage to be ourselves. Mm. It's, Ooh, uh, what does that mean? Well, God made every one of us uniquely. I love the, 
C.S. Lewis gives this image of heaven, you know, like God is a, a jewel with as many facets as there are persons. And each person is entrusted with a facet of God to sort of embody and understand and live and reflect. And heaven is sharing my facet of God with everybody and receiving everybody else's facet of God. Mm. So I need to give myself over to that completely. And, you know, and St. Therese's littleness or maybe St. Thomas's brilliance or anyway, we have a yeah. different slice of the pie. We yeah. have our own, you know, somebody who becomes finally discovers it at age 70, somebody who discovers it at age five. Uh, e each thing is, is a unique, every relationship with God is unique in that way. Yeah, that's, that's really important to say because I think it can come, become a little trite when you say be the best version of yourself or something <laughs> like that. But there is a sense in which that's true, that, yeah. that when you come into a relationship with God and he sanctifies you, you don't become less yourself. That's right. I remember after my trip to World Youth Day in Rome, uh, the next World Youth Day was Toronto in 2002, and my youth minister at the time tried to encourage someone to go, and they said, well, I don't want to come back like Matt, me. <laughs> and then she said, well, you won't. You'll, just, you'll come back more like yourself, and that was, I thought That's that was great. nice. Yeah. yeah, yeah. love doesn't make us more like somebody else. Love makes us more like ourselves. Mm. And uh, we had uh, Cardinal DiNardo before, when he was, he was bishop of uh, Sioux Falls, and, uh, but he's from... Pittsburgh, and he came and he preached the, the solemnity of St. Benedict for us. And I remember this is when I was a novice or maybe my second year in the monastery. And he said, people sometimes would think that monks living by the same rule would develop into a uniformity. And he said, well, my experience of monasteries is there are never so many unique characters as I find in monasteries. And that's a sign that there's a lot of love because love makes us unique. Love, love makes brings us out unique and gives space for us to be who we are. Yeah, that's right. Almost, that's right. And that's interesting. Jason Everett made that uh, analogy once. He said, "You look at the great dictators of the world. You line them up, and they all seem <laughs> boringly alike. But then you compare Mother Teresa to you know whoever else, Saint Francis, uh, Assisi, etc., and you see uh, it's like a field of flowers." Mm, amen. Beautiful. Hmm. Well, as we wrap up, where can people learn more about you? We're going to put that link to, to your books below, St. Saint, Saint Paul Center. And I would just encourage people, honestly, like if you're going to get one of Father Boniface's books, consider buying it from the St. Paul Center. I think it's really important that we, you know, we frequent these Catholic apostolates and not just go directly to Amazon because it's easier. But nonetheless, I'm sure it is on Amazon. It, it is on Amazon. Uh, yeah. yeah, you can give Amazon more money or you can give my monastery more money. Those are the two choices. Oh, why? What does that mean? I get a little more royalty from uh, the what goes through the St. Paul Center. Ah, that goes to your monastery. So uh, otherwise, Amazon gets the uh, <laughs> little extra. But... Uh, yeah, and I don't. I made a vow of poverty. That's our poverty is communal poverty. So I, I literally signed over power of attorney to the abbot when I made solemn vows, mm. and uh, I don't own anything of my own. We own yeah. uh, everything. So, so that money goes to the monastery, not to you. Exactly. That's right. Yeah, that's excellent. right. So yeah, what book? I mean, if if someone's watching right now, they're like, okay, I want one book. I don't want to. I know there's three or something, but what's the <laughs> book you want me to get? Tell me to get that one. Well. Uh, I think the, the personal prayer book is, uh, is, a, is a great entryway. The St. Joseph book, I would say, is an application of personal prayer to a devotion to St. Joseph. So I think you find a nice resonance there. Mm. And it's the year of St. Joseph, so it's a St. Joseph one's a little smaller. I don't know. you gotta, you got to choose. The, the spiritual direction book is certainly, first of all, for spiritual directors, and then for anybody who wants to help somebody else on the journey of faith. So. Yeah. I think uh, parents and nurses and doctors and teachers and uh, coaches and a lot of people could benefit from the spiritual direction book, but it certainly would be a little bit more specialized. The other two, um, pick one of them. I think they're I think they're both worth reading. All right. Well, look, listen. As we as we wrap up here now, we've got almost four hundred people who are watching right now, and we'll have tens of thousands who will watch eventually. It would be just lovely if all of us decided to pray together and you could lead us in this prayer and so that those who are watching live turn your phone off exit out of all the other windows um and just just let's let's pray together and uh would you mind doing that would you mind leading us in that unless they're watching on their phone then they should leave their phone on that's right but all the other windows but this one so all the other distractions <laughs> that <laughs> get rid of those leave this window up and here we go no i'd be delighted to pray thank you lord and uh, just to be in his presence, 
is to know that God is with us. The Father is looking on us with love, each one of us, no matter who we are or what we've done. The Father is looking on us with love. He's just delighted with us, delighted that we would take a moment to be with him after such an exciting conversation. Lord, we're we're grateful that you inspired us with this conversation and so many other things we could have said and we'd like to say and maybe we'll say in the future, but we said these things and I pray that it was under your inspiration and by your guidance and that you take that and, and make that work in the hearts of everybody who's who's watching is listening you know what they need you know what each of us need lord and you want to provide what we need because you want us to have eternal happiness thank you thank you for making us for redeeming us for calling us to yourself thank you for being in our lives and being with us Mm -hmm. in a special way at this moment thank you for your love that embraces every person and and wants to foster our uniqueness wants to foster our freedom you don't mold us into cookie cutters, uh, cookie cutter images, but rather make us your children, yes. uh, a field of flowers, uh, a field of humanity. And so I ask you, Lord, also, as you, you know the needs of each person, some people are, are hurting in some way, maybe a broken relationship, maybe hurting because they've tried to find you and they've run up against the, the humanity of the church or they've run up against the failures of different ministers or different representatives of Christianity. Maybe they're seeking and looking for those answers. Lord, I ask that you would inspire them, give them light, give them healing, give them patience, mercy, forgiveness. Some people who are who are watching this who are struggling with their own sins and wondering if they can Uh, Matt Frad and Father Boniface look so holy and they've got it all together and help them see enough of the truth, uh, not to expose all of our sins to them, but but certainly to help them see that we're struggling sinners as they are and and that you have room in your kingdom for everyone. You delight in every person and uh, you're ready to meet us where we are. You don't need us to become something else to earn our place, but you meet us where we are and help each of our, our viewers to feel that as well. And Lord, I'm just grateful for this time and ask that you would continue to bless me, to bless Matt, to Mm. bless the studio crew here and and all who will sit in this chair in the future and who have sat in this chair in the past and that this apostolate may be really an instrument for introducing people to you and for building up your kingdom. And I'd just like to entrust all of this to you as we remember the communion of saints and and ask in a special way for the prayers of Our Lady. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. And through the intercession of Our Lady and St. Joseph and St. Benedict, and St. Thomas Aquinas, may Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you taking the time to do this. This was super fun. Um, yeah, yeah. It's kind of awkward transition from a beautiful time of prayer to hi, but hi. <laughs> uh, thank you for being here. If you haven't yet subscribed to our channel, you might consider doing that. Click subscribe and then that bell button, and that way big tech will be forced to alert you to every time we put out a new video. And that's just a cool thing to do. So you should do that right now. Thanks for being here. See ya. Thanks. Thanks. That was great.